adoption of the agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda? It's been a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Opposed no. Ayes have it. Uh, and the agenda is adopted. Uh, item C, which is the approval of the December 13th, 2018 minutes. Uh, those were uh, mailed to you uh, previously, and I hope that y'all have reviewed those. Uh, is there a motion to adopt, before, or is there any discussion? Motion to, we'll need a motion to adopt those minutes. There's been a motion and a second. Any discussion, I'll make sure we, okay on the minutes. Seeing no discussion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and the minutes have been adopted. And so now we're on to the recognition of the council members, and we always um, first come, first serve basis, to be fair. And so as I saw uh, the council members come in, first is Council Lady Van Reese. Is she, I think she was in the hallway, but yeah, see if she wants to speak now or during the item. We'll make sure, give her a second. Thank you. All right, we'll go down the list and get, uh, see if she wants to speak. Oh, is she? Come on up, Council Lady. No rush, we're okay. Come on up. Welcome. Welcome. Hi there. I, I won't apologize for talking to constituents. So I was out in the hallway, but uh, good afternoon. Happy New Year. Thank you all again for your service every hour of every day uh, thinking about this. People might not realize that you get big packets of stuff you have to read to prepare for this, and thank you for the extra time that we don't even see. Uh, I'm here because there are two items uh, on consent uh, in District 8, and as is my uh, ilk, I like to come and let you know that even though they're on consent, um, that they are items that have been discussed in the community. Uh, that includes the Skyline uh, 808 at Skyline Ridge and the uh, Altitude at 41. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Dickerson Pike is also known as 41. So if you hear people, uh, it's, it's, there you go. So the Altitude at 41 um, is uh, something that uh, was a specific plan that started uh, with uh, Councilwoman Bennett and is now uh, being realized. And you'll see there that some of these early plans have to do with commercial um, along Dickerson Pike next to the new um, uh, project that uh, hopefully the Hampton Inn uh, will be open uh, in time for uh, the NFL draft. So things are happening there on Dickerson Pike, and this is just an extension of that. It is on the corner, if you will, of Dickerson Pike and the new Skyline Ridge Drive, uh, formerly known as Old Due West. Um, up the road there at Skyline Ridge Drive is where you see the 808 at Skyline Ridge. It is directly across the street from Music City Solar, and uh, we are excited to be able to offer uh, yet another development from LDG as uh, workforce housing. So uh, mixing up the housing types of both commercial rate um, with incredible views. Uh, uh, you don't call something altitude if you can't see something from there, so altitude, and also at Skyline Ridge, uh, being able to make sure that there are opportunities for all different types of people in different situations to enjoy um, District 8 near Skyline Hospital. So um, there have been uh, opportunities for community uh, involvement and discussion in both of these projects, and uh, they both received community support as well as from the planning staff. So I just wanted to come and thank you for your attention to those things and to encourage you to please come visit uh, and let me know when you're coming. Uh, thanks again for your help on this, and uh, I appreciate it being on consent today. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Appreciate you coming down, Council Lady. Council Withers, you want to go? Welcome. Appreciate you coming down. Good to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to y'all as well. Um, I'm here just for a couple items. I think many of these are on consent, but just wanted to provide a couple of comments. Um, items 16 and 17 pertaining to uh, preservation permits for uh, projects within historic districts. I'm a co-sponsor of that one and um, encourage you to 
approve that one if there are no serious concerns. It's always good to uh, clarify um, what work does and does not require review of the Historic Commission, so I think that's um, wise. Also, I'm a, a proponent of the historic interiors. Um, right now, the historic protections that we have, which are applied with the consent of property owners, apply mostly to the <laughs> exterior buildings, but we do have some structures that have interior features that we would recognize as being historic, and having a way to designate those specific features uh, is, is a good thing, which again, if it's applied to individual properties, would require the consent, or usually would require the consent of the property owner to apply. But uh, uh, I'm a co-sponsor of that one as well, working with the Historic Zoning Commission staff and encourage approval of that. Item 21, uh, which is located across the street from District 6, but also across the street from my house, um, is uh, pertains to 1216 Gallatin Avenue. This is the former Walmart neighborhood uh, store that was repurposed or renovated into a storage facility and a retail building was built along the front of it, which looks fantastic. Uh, it's a brick brick structure. This just allows some additional uses. There's an urgent care clinic that's wanting to move in and it seems like that particular use isn't allowed there. We do have some retail users that are moving in, but I think that would be a fine upgrade to Gallatin Avenue is one who's lived along that corridor. So I'm, uh, even though it's not in District 6, I'm a neighbor to that and I'm very much in support of that. Finally, I do want to speak on item 15, which pertains to tree canopy protections. Uh, District 6 residents um, are very, very vocal about uh, loss of trees and trying to preserve trees um, in uh, with uh, single and two-family lot redevelopment as well as within the Casey Homes. We're trying to work as much as we can with folks on that within the Casey Homes. Definitely is a, a major issue in uh, District 6 and some of the surrounding East Nashville communities. I'm not a lead sponsor of that one, but I am a co-sponsor of it. Um, and I was contacted by uh, some of my uh, constituents and business owners in the district who are landscape architects and are professionals in that field. They just had some questions or concerns. They were wanting to recommend a deferral so they could work on it a little bit longer uh, with the lead sponsors. I think that's a really good idea just to try to get it right before it comes to council. The council is not necessarily a, a technically uh, we're not all uh, technically savvy in some of those areas, so I think just helping the council to have that information be on the record and, and be looked at from a couple of different angles and we have a more robust recommendation to council when it comes through. I think a, a, a deferral of, of some length of time uh, is a good idea as long as we can still get it back on the council uh, public hearing agenda so we could pass that legislation in a finalized form during this term. So I'm generally in favor of it, but I do recognize the concerns that some of uh, my constituents and professionals in that field, who are also big tree advocates, uh, have. They just want to make sure that we get it right. So I, I think that a deferral is a good idea that is ultimately up to the lead sponsors and y'all, but, but I'm in favor of a deferral to, to allow some additional work to continue. Thank you, Councilman. All right, appreciate you coming down. Thank you. Next on the list is Councilman Sledge. I'm awake. You awake? Okay. Make sure I make a note of that. Councilman Pridemore. Uh, yes, sir. I'll, if you don't mind, I'll wait. Okay, perfect. Councilor Haywood. You wait? Okay. And then Councilman Davis, you want to wait or go now or? Come up here for a second and tell us what you're saying. I can't hear you. Sorry. Appreciate you coming down. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. It's good to see you all again. You know. Which item were you looking for? Maybe we I'm can. It's on Cowan Street, and it breaks my heart to defer it because this is for fun things that we all love. It's for indoor, indoor skydiving. But we have a minor problem Item with the, 30. Yeah, but we have a minor problem with the intersection. That I think we can I know we can work it out by next meeting because of all the um cuz even though our public works department is very talented, you know, we can we can always use help from our planning department too. You know. And so what we're going to do is we're going to fix it. Um I think it's an issue of about 10 to 15 feet cuz we're redesigning the intersection right now and we want to make sure there their building aligns up with the design and intersection. Now, Lucy, I know your staff could have said it a little more eloquently than me, but, you know, 
Well, well, thank you. As you say, this is an, um, do you mind if I clarify? Please. <laughs> okay, thank you. This is an important uh, site and it's critical to align the infrastructure. Um, the applicant did agree to a condition um, and you should have a memo before you that basically would allow for um, further discussion of the right of way. I think we can continue, if the councilman would like to request a, a deferral, I think we could entertain that, but I feel we call the, the owner of the property. Okay. And he's not, he's going to fly down. Okay. And we really want to clear this up. And, you know, generally I'd be comfortable moving forward with this condition letter. Okay. But, but since I was, at, we were unable in the last hour to get all the parties on the phone. Okay. And for everybody to 100% verify that that extra 10 or 5 or however it is that's required gets done. And everybody's willing. So if we defer one meeting, it still can track for the scheduled council meeting. Okay. So I'm okay, because I won't slow them down technically. Okay, so I'm understanding that even with the condition that would allow time to work out the right of way, it would be your preference to, to recommend to the commission because to defer. Because I, okay. I said I would do it, and okay. I don't want to change my mind. Yeah, okay. And all of a sudden, they're, hey, you know. Okay. We'll add it to the deferral list per your recommendation. Right. And the rest of the bills, I'll wait till they're in front of everybody. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Bless you all. Appreciate you coming in. And then, Councilor Henderson, you said you wanted to wait as well till the your item. Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. I didn't. Any other council members? Oh, we'll make sure we didn't. We're missing. All right. It looks like we have finished with the council members, and so we are now on to item E, which is items for deferral withdrawal. Lisa. The following items are, are for deferral or withdrawal. Item 1A, 2018 CP 006002 on page five of your agenda, a Bellevue Community Plan Amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item 1B, 2018 SP 043001, the associated case, S Security Central Storage SP. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item 2A, 2018 CP 010003, Green Hills Midtown Community Plan Amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 24th Planning Commission meeting, and I will note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. Item 2B, 2018 SP 077001, on page six of your agenda, the novel Edge Hill SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 24th Planning Commission meeting, and I will note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. Item number six, 2018 SP 074001 on page seven of your agenda. 3049 Earhart, staff recommendation is to defer to the January 24th Planning Commission meeting. Item number seven, 2018 SP 076001, 2138 18th Avenue North SP. Staff recommendation is to withdraw. Item number 11, 2018Z124PR001 on page 7. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 14th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 13. 2018Z127PR001, staff recommendation is to defer to the January 24th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 14, 2018Z129PR001 on page 8 of your agenda. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 24th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 19, 2014SP072003 on page 9 of your agenda, 19th and Broadway Mixed Use Development Amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 24th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 20, 2015SP019003, the 121 Lucille Street SP Amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 24th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 22, 2019 SP 003001, the Old Hickory Retreat SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 14th Planning Commission meeting. 
Item number 23, 2019 SP004001, Bate Avenue Residences SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 24th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 24, 2016 NHL 001002, The Barn at Mayo Farm. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 24th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 28, 2019 S015001 on page 10 of your agenda. The McKinnis property plat. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 24th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 36, 2019Z008PR001 on page 11 of your agenda. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 24th Planning Commission meeting. So, yeah, did you state item 30 was for deferral? Nope, because I have it yep. on Our new edition. Yes, item number 30, 2017 UD 005002, 100 Spring Street, modification in River North UDO. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 24th Planning Commission meeting. Per the applicant and the, per, yes. and the council. Thank you. All right, so let's go through this list. Um, commissioners, make sure, and Lisa, make sure I'm, I'm right here. Uh, items 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, 6, 7, 11, 13, 14, 19, 20, 22, 23, 24, 28, 30, and 36. Is That's that, correct. That's correct. Yes. Commissioners, you've heard the items for deferral, 30 and 36. Any other questions? We'll, we have a motion to approve and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Ayes have it and those items are deferred. Now we're on to item F, which is the consent agenda. Lisa? As information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with a decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. As noticed to the public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. The following items are on the consent agenda. Item 3A, 2018 CP 012005 on page six of your agenda, Southeast Community Plan Amendment. A request to amend the Southeast Community Plan by changing from district office concentration to suburban neighborhood center on a portion of property located on Bell Road. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 3B, 2007 SP 156003, the associated case, the Collection Nashville SP Amendment. It's a request to amend a staff, amend a specific plan on property located at 1638 Bell Road uh, to permit 70 multifamily residential units, 1,500 square feet of retail, and maintain the existing office business school. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions subject to approval of the associated plan amendment. I will note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from both 3A and 3B. Item 4, 2018, SP 061001, 725 Hart Avenue Townhomes, a request to rezone from RS to SP uh, for property located on 725 Hart Avenue to permit up to three residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number eight, 2018 SP 083001 on page seven of your agenda. The 808 at Skyline Ridge SP, a request to rezone from RS10 to SP mixed use for property located on Skyline Ridge Drive to permit 214 multifamily units and 2,500 square feet of non-residential use. 
Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 10, 2018-Z, 122-PR-001 on page 7, a request to rezone from RS-20 to AR-2A zoning for property located at 3801 Knight Drive. Staff recommendation is to approve, and I will note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. Item number 12, 2018-Z, 125-PR-001 on page 7, a request to rezone from RS-5 to R-6 zoning for property located on Ward Street. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 16, 2018-Z, 011-TX-001 on page 8 of your agenda. It's a request to amend the zoning code and to require preservation permits before any action within a historic overlay district. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 17, 2018-Z, 012-TX-001, a request to amend Title 17 of the Zoning Code to allow public interior spaces to be afforded historic landmark protect protection. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 18, 2018 CP 005003, East Nashville Community Plan Amendment. It's a request to amend the East Nashville Community Plan by, by changing from urban neighborhood maintenance to urban community center and transition policy on properties located on McGavick Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve. The associated case, uh, 2018 Z 123 PR 001. A request to rezone from R6 to OR20 zoning for property located at, on McGavick Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve, subject to approval of the associated plan amendment. Item number 21, 2016 SP 069003 on page 9 of your agenda. 1216 Gallatin Avenue SP amendment. A request to amend a specific plan on property located on Gallatin Avenue to permit a self-service storage facility on lot 1 and all uses permitted by MULA on lot 2. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. <laughs> Item number 25, 2018 HL 003000 one on page 10 115 cottage lane it's a request to apply a historic landmark overlay on property located at 115 cottage lane staff recommendation is to approve Item number 26, 2018-S-058001, the Alice Street subdivision, a request for concept plan approval to create nine lots, including two duplex lots for a total of 11 units on properties located on Alice Street and West Trinity Lane. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 27, 2019-S-008001, altitude at 41 phase one, a request for concept plan approval to create six lots on property located on Dickerson Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item 29-176-75P-002, Neely's Bend PUD cancellation. It's a request to cancel a planned unit development located on Neely's Bend Road and part of property located on Neely's Bend Road. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 31, 2018 DTC 035001 on page 11 of your agenda. The 1101 Grundy Street Hotel. It's a request for a modification of overall building height to allow 20 stories on property located on Grundy Street. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Oh, sorry. Item number 34, 2019-Z-006-PR-001 on page 11, a request to rezone from R10 to CS for properties located on Upshaw Drive. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 35, 2019-Z-007-PR-001, a request to rezone from IWD to MUNA for property located on Little Green Street. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 37, 2019-Z-009-PR-001, a request to rezone from IR to MUGA for zoning for property located on Hamilton Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 38 on page 12 of your agenda, 2019-Z-012-PR-001, a request to rezone from RS-5 to R-6 for property located at 888 Carter Street. Item number 39, 2009-Z, 013-PR-001, a request to rezone from RS-5 to R-6A for property located on 14th Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to approve. 
And under other business, item number 40, a new employment contract for Joran Donovan. And number 44, to accept the director's report and approve administrative items. Thank you, Lisa. All right, commissioners, so you've, <laughs> you've heard, oh, you've heard the items for the consent agenda, but let's go through these slowly because it is a long list. Uh, so on the consent agenda are items 3A, 3B, 4, 8, 10, 12, 16, 17, 18A, 18B, 21, 25, 26, 27, 29, 31, 34, 35, 37, 38, 39, 40, and 44. Is that correct? It is. Commissioners? I'd like to know my refusal from 21. No, okay, so noted. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other discussion or comments on the consent agenda? We'll need a motion. Is there a motion to approve? There's a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and the consent agenda is adopted. And so for everybody, for the commissioners and everyone in the room, the items that we are going to hear today, and make sure I'm correct on this, we have four items to hear, and it'd be items number 5, 9, 15, and 33. Is that right, everybody? What about 25 and 33? 30. 30. 35 was on the 45. Oh, 25. Hold on. 25 is on the cons was on the consent agenda. I thought 25 got pulled. No, no. 25 did not get. It got put back on the consent agenda. What about 32? Hold on. We have a question on 32. Hold hold on. Say, let's let everybody. If you all could. Uh, Quickly and quietly exit the room. We appreciate it. 32 is going to be heard, and it is a disapproval. Is that correct? Okay, so 32, 32 and 33. Okay, I missed that too. I'm sorry. So let's get this straight, make sure everybody's good. So we're going to actually hear five items, and it will be items number 5, 9, 15, 32, and 33. Does that look correct? Please. Perfect. All right, and so I, I do want to, um, before we get started, I'm just going to take a quick, very quick moment of, of personal privilege. Um, since it's the new year, I just want to thank all of the commissioners uh, for all of your volunteer time. This is a not, not a paid position. I know there are long nights and some of the, it's compli it, it gets complicated quickly. And so I do want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart and, and Lucy's heart that we appreciate, um, you know, your, your volunteerism. Um, and, and I do want to say that uh, we've had a transition this year with, with Lucy and it's been a really great one. And I think um, that Lucy and the, the team um, are doing, our director and the team are doing great. So I want to thank everybody. It was a good 2018. I feel like 2019 is also going to be great. And I just wanted to say thank you to everybody before we got started. Um, so thank you. You're welcome. And I do uh, want to, I, I appreciate the staff. They spend a lot of time uh, answering a lot of questions from us. So I appreciate them very much. All right, so let's go ahead and we are on item number five. Hello. Item number five is a request. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Item five is a request to rezone property in the Whites Creek area. Property is outlined in red and consists of several properties, approximately 116 acres. It's bound by Whites Creek, Green Lane, and Knight Road. The recommendation or the request is to go from IWD R10 to specific plan residential. Staff is recommending disapproval. The existing zoning is IWD, which is an industrial warehousing distribution district, permits low intensity industrial, including warehousing and distribution uses. R10 permits one and two family residential. Also note the IWD area is outlined in red. 
This is the proposed SP. It calls for 303 single family lots, including 56 house lots and 247 cottage lots. The 56 house lots are outlined in red. This is the larger of the two lots and requires a minimum of 6,000 square feet. All these lots are front loaded and the max height is three stories. The 247 cottage lots are outlined in red. It has a minimum, square, minimum lot area of 2,500 square feet. These units are front loaded on drives or open space and the max height is three stories. Open space in the plan is approximately 77 acres. That includes about 14 acres of active open space, which includes courtyards, amenity areas, and trails. This is a gated community, and all drives are private. Um, there is access into the development from Knight Road and Green Lane. There's also an emergency exit onto Tisdall, which is where the red arrow is. These are views of example architectural elevations. At the top, you have the cottage units, and at the bottom, you have house <coughs> units. This is in the Bordeaux White Creek Haynes Trinity Community Plan. The policies are conservation, sur suburban neighborhood maintenance, and su suburban neighborhood evolving. This, this request, or I'm sorry, the neighborhood maintenance is in the hatch area, and the neighborhood evolving is the yellow area on this slide. Neighborhood maintenance and neighborhood evolving are both residential policies. They can permit a variety of housing types. Neighborhood maintenance is intended to maintain the general character of an area, and neighborhood evolving areas tend to experience change over time. A goal of both of these policies is to provide and enhance public street connectivity. Street connectivity is important because it connects neighborhoods, allows for safe pedestrian movement, provides additional routes that can reduce congestion, shorten trips, and also provides for additional emergency response routes. This plan does not meet this goal and is inconsistent with the policy. As proposed, there are no public street connections, including to the Deer Meadows subdivision, which has five planned connections, which are shown in the blocks of Tisdale, Deer Meadows, and Shady Drive, Shady Side Drive. In addition, the lot pattern is not consistent with the policies. In the slide, the yellow is the neighborhood maintenance areas, which are intended to maintain the general character, and the red shaded areas is the neighborhood evolving, which is the areas that would experience change over time. As proposed, the cottage units are all in the neighborhood maintenance. These are the smaller lots and have narrow setbacks. These are out of character with the surrounding larger lots that are spaced further apart. Inclusion staff is recommending disapproval as a request is not consistent with the land use policy. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. We'll open this item for public hearing. And is the applicant in the room, Mr. White? Yeah, as you know, you have 10 minutes, and you can save two of the 10 for rebuttal. Welcome. That's what I'd like to do. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Tom White. Uh, I represent the applicant here, 315 Dedrick Street. Uh, Joe Effes, the engineer for the project, is here, as is Mr. John Floyd, who's the head of the uh, applicant here. Uh, with respect to the uh, front-end comments, I'd like to thank Council Lady Haywood. This is her district. Uh, she's had any number of meetings out there with the people most directly involved with this. My client has attended all those meetings. She's had innumerable phone conversations about it. She's here today. She's totally supportive. She can speak as to why she is supportive. Uh, with respect to the zone changes, was common is from IWD and R10 to an SP plan. Uh, our argument today is basically is in this particular case, policies and interpretation by the commission members I'm talking to right now. Uh, this is, in my opinion, a totally mixed bag of policies. On the property itself, you've got T3 in different categories. You're surrounded uh, by property that is T2. Uh, and the staff makes those comments. So our presentation today is that what we're suggesting is consistent with policy. That's your decision to make today. Uh, with respect to uh, the items that are mentioned, the staff has commented that uh, they are opposed on three bases. One's connectivity, one is sidewalks, the other's lot size. Uh, let's deal with those. And there's a comment also about density. Uh, the current density allowed on the property as it is right now is 607 units of which 120 could be duplex units. Our proposal is 303, or half of that density on the property. So there's no squeeze for density here. It's cutting it in half. Uh, but with respect to the uh, issue of the staff's comments, first of all, the connectivity. Uh, again, we're surrounded by a piece of property that's R2. And I'm paraphrasing from the policy language for uh, T2. 
A key factor to the T2RM policy is low levels of connectivity. Pedestrian connectivity is encouraged in this policy area through the use of interconnected greenways and other natural corridors. The T2 RCS policy areas are suited primarily for the maintenance of the land in natural state with low levels of connectivity. That's exactly what my client's done here. We're surrounded by a T2 policy area, uh, and so we've been very sensitive to being sure that there are greenways uh, and location areas between our client's property and Deer Meadows. You might ask, uh, Deer Meadows, uh, what's their position? The council lady can speak for them. There's been any number of neighborhood meetings. Deer Meadows, Deer Meadows doesn't want the connectivity for all the traffic coming through their development. Uh, so it is a gated community, which has been favorably received by the community. But with respect to the uh, road connections, they're not there. They're gated. But again, that's consistent with T2, which is the area that's surrounding my client's property. With respect to sidewalks, for my client's development, uh, again, paraphrasing, the internal drives within the proposed development are to be private. They've been designed in a loop pattern with no proposed cul-de-sacs and multiple gated access points to the existing public roads, Knight Lane, Green Lane, uh, and Tisdale Drive. This allows for a high degree of connectivity with the T3 policy area with multiple vehicular traffic path options within the development. We've got that. Uh, with respect to lot size, let's deal with this. First of all, as I've commented, our total count is 303 as opposed to 607 with 121 of those being duplexes. But the staff comment uh, on that is interesting because the staff makes the comment that our lot sizes are appropriate. They just don't feel like they're in the right place within the development. Again, that's a policy call and a policy decision. But if you look at uh, page 37 and 36 of the uh, staff's report, uh, they're very clear that those lot sizes are appropriate, they just feel that they're in the wrong place, and that was part of what uh, Jason's comment was here. Uh, quote, uh, the lot sizes uh, are located in the neighborhood evolving. These lots have a minimum lot size of 6,000, which is more consistent with the average, uh, excuse me, which is more consistent with the average for the lot size in Deer Meadows and other subdivisions in the area. This lot size is more appropriate in the maintenance area. So they're saying the lot sizes are appropriate, but they feel like they're within the wrong place within the development. That in part is a builder development call. It's in part a community uh, input involvement. Uh, which I think has been exhaustively commented about, and the council lady can reference that. Uh, but again, uh, with respect to lot size, again, I think it's clear, even the staff's analysis is that it is appropriate. Uh, the 6,000 square foot lots, the smaller lots that are appropriate, just should be in a different place within the development. Um, with respect to uh, the uh, staff comments about uh, density, I've mentioned that already. Uh, with respect to letters of support, I haven't seen everything that's come in, but the three letters that came in uh, prior to today were all supportive. Most importantly, people can have opinions and write in and uh, make comments when they may be miles away. The most important letter came in from the executive director of KIPP Academy. They're immediately next door. They've been there for six plus years. Uh, I didn't talk to that gentleman, but he sent in a letter down here that was unequivocally supportive. So they've been in the neighborhood for six years. They want great neighborhood support. Uh, they've seen that there. They've seen the quality of the other developments done by the same applicant. They like that. It's unusual for somebody in that type of system to reach out here and explain it and give that letter of support. Uh, but it's part of the package, and I don't think it's any clear. This gentleman's name is Randy Dowell. He's the executive director. And the KIPP program, there's a college prep public charter school. They're very concerned about what takes place in their neighborhood and their relationships with the developer, which is what they have here. The other thing I'll comment about is that there's 77 acres of open space here. It's not all passive, a lot of it's active. Uh, that's particularly unusual, and a lot of the members of this commission were involved when we had the long discussion about what's T2 and what's T3 in this part of the community. One of the driving factors was, can we have a lot of open space? This is a, a perfect plan for something like that, where you've got 77 acres, a lot of it active, uh, some passive, uh, but it certainly is a, a real hallmark for that type of development. There's another uh, principle uh, within the, I'm paraphrasing again, the language in T2 and T3, where they talk about a variation in lot sizes should be proposed within the development to allow for the preservation of existing streams and large areas of undisturbed open space, protecting the overall health of the watershed. I think that's what you've got here. Um, with respect to 
uh, other matters, every Metro department, to my knowledge, is signed off and approved. We talk about road configuration, look at public works report, it's exhaustive in their support for what we're looking for here. But my clients agreed to every suggestion from every Metro department, uh, period. Uh, Again, our argument is it's consistent with the policy. The policy is your interpretation, but where do you see a T3 piece like this that has T3 neighborhood evolving, T3 neighborhood uh, maintenance, all the other policies surrounded uh, by a T2 piece of policy? We've worked those in together. It's your decision as to whether or not it's consistent with policy. We respectfully submit that it is. I want to thank Jason Swaggart. My client has worked with the staff down here for probably nine months on this matter. They've been down here any number of times. There's been good comments made by the staff, some of which we've incorporated, uh, but I respectfully submit it's a policy call. I submit that we're consistent with it. Council Lady Haywood is here and can speak for herself. I think it's very clear there's tremendous community support for the plan and from the council lady. Thank you for your courtesies, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. White, and we will reserve two minutes for your rebuttal. And then, Council Lady Haywood, generally what we do is do all the public comments and then let you speak last. Is that okay? Perfect. Okay. So, anyone wishing to speak in support? Come on up. Y'all, and if you would, if you would just line up in the middle aisle here, and then uh, you've got two minutes, um, and then state your name and your address for the record. Come on up, and then the clock is right here to watch your time. Okay. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Phyllis Davis. I live at 1408 Cranapple Cove. I'm a real estate broker, and I work in this area a lot. We don't have a whole lot of quality products to sell. Uh, there are a lot of people that want to live in the area, but they end up having to move to Clarksville or even further out because there's not a lot of inventory in that area, and it hasn't been for a while. Um, Old South builds a very quality product, and um, I wish that you all would approve this because we really need some more housing in the area. I'm not going to take the whole two, two minutes. That's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Rhonda Hunt. I live at 590 Green Lane, and I just want to say that I am for the development. I think it'll be an awesome thing. Thank you. Thank you. Come on up. Welcome. I'm Greg Ferricelli. I live at uh, 1845 Bell Arbor Drive, and um, I'm in support. Um, one of the biggest reasons is um, that zip code is lacking a lot of it's one of the zip codes that you could actually buy something that is at an affordable price. It has the most equity in the area. And I feel like the more developments we get like this, I feel what is lacking in that area is commercial and places for people to go, things for people to do, uh, mixed use, coffee shops, things like that. And I feel like the more people that could actually live out there, hopefully the commercial will catch up and um, have somewhere for everybody out there to go. It's very um, limited when it comes to that. And I'm hoping to see more residential and have more commercial. So I'm in, uh, I'm in approval for that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Hello. My name is Nick Baker. I live at uh, 3411 White Creek Pike. I'm in favor because with this proposed plan, we'll save over uh, 50 acres of wooded area, which I think is very important when you're doing developments like this, and also to cut down on crime and help re revitalize the area. And as the gentleman before me said, um, it'll promote more uh, commercial and retail space in the area. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Welcome. Well, thank you. I'm good Jimmy Standridge, and I just recently moved in 6190 on Del Sol Drive. And by me being a new homeowner in that area, it was very discouraging trying to find an affordable home within town. So as a new homeowner, I'm in favor of them expanding because there's not very many affordable homes within that district at all or in the Nashville vicinity. So I'm very in favor of them expanding their properties within that area. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Harry Spear, I live at 6249 Del Sol Drive, uh, right off Green Lane there. Also very in favor of this. Uh, after being a long time resident uh, of the inner city downtown, uh, got the opportunity to buy a house and was looking in other counties, uh, frankly, and stumbled upon White's Creek in my search and to everybody else's point, found an affordable house. 
No, now I can let my dog out in the backyard and don't have to go down an escalator and elevator every every morning and, and paying over, overpaid rent there. So definitely, definitely in favor of uh, the revitalization of the area and the continued growth. I'm um, looking forward to the neighborhood uh, really, really growing. I know our neighborhood um, has, has really come together and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing that continue to grow. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Well, good afternoon. My name is John Honeysucker. I live at 1014 Loopy Circle. I'm only here as a part of, first of all, thank you all for taking time to hear us today. Uh, I'm here as in for validation of community outreach and transparency. Uh, under the leadership in that district of uh, Council Lady Brenda Haywood, uh, she has encouraged that numerous times throughout her meetings. Uh, I think that we can all respect the fact that she will not move ahead or move forward with anything unless it's, if it's an, it has not been vetted through the community. Uh, by way of that, I'm saying be, uh, having different departments there for meetings to, uh, whether it be stormwater, uh, anything related to water, infrastructure. She has invited the correct personnel and the departments to be there to attend. Uh, we've had, uh, I think I've attended three or four meetings in regards to just this subdivision alone and this investment uh, development that they're looking to uh, develop here in this area. So I do want to share with you the appropriate measures have been taken to make sure that this has been vetted with the community, along with the different investors, and also with the council members. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? We'll make sure we get everybody. All right. Seeing none, anyone in opposition? Yes. Come on up. Good evening and well, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. And I am very glad to speak today. Um, I have lived in White's Creek. Uh, first of all, I'm Wilma Buchanan, and I live at 3480 Night Drive. I've lived there for almost 18 years uh, when I have not been invited, unfortunately, to any of the meetings that involve the community and this development. I remember when it was first being proposed, the first phase of it, which was VISTA, and I'm not sure why I didn't get the notices or anything, because I've been, uh, I've made myself available. But it is very important. We moved to this area. I also worked, let me back up. I also worked when we were talking about Nashville Next. I was one of the persons who worked on the team to keep Nashville Next, how we wanted to look in our area for 25 years from now. And we wanted our neighborhood to look rural, comfortable, uh, re uh, yet residential. We do, are not against people living in our neighborhood, but we are not asking for clusters. We move from clusters, and we are hoping that we are able to keep this as a nice residential way out neighborhood where we can see deer, coyotes, foxes, and all of that. I hope our council person will consider the rest of the neighborhood and give us some notice as well, because I am certainly in opposition of 303. It will certainly put the traffic in our area. It will also, I happen to be associated with the Nashville's crime situation. It will certainly add to the crime situation, and that is, and that is a fact. I want to see Nashville grow, but it has to grow in the right way. Thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome. My name's Elise Hudson, 4601 Whites Creek Pike, soon to probably be 536 Brick Church Lane, less than a mile from this development. Um, I, I want to talk very quickly about the Community Character Manual for Whites Creek Bordeaux area. It talks about this area along White, um, along Briley Parkway in very specific terms about how this area is in transition and needs to be paid close attention to. There are areas of T3 abutting R2, and I think they knew that coming into um, or coming out of Nashville next and wanted to make sure you guys knew it was an area to really pay attention to and do the right thing for. I'm not against the developer. We know houses are going in there. We have concerns about a gated community connectivity in those areas. If you allow someone to come in, and even though it's an SP, but to build in what was T3NE and put the wrong kind of density or put put something there, it sets a really dangerous precedent for other areas that are currently vacant, but probably soon to be developed over the next 10 years. I think that 
my personal judgment too is that this is a misuse of an SP because there's not a whole lot coming back to the community. There's a lot of green space up there, but it's almost like the developer just doesn't want to pay to have that um, infrastructure put in for the larger lots that they would normally have to build on the area. Um, they talk about walking trails, but there's no access to it from anybody but within that particular gated community so that we wouldn't have access. Um, I think that some of the other folks that were unable to be here tonight were also within a mile of, of this area. There isn't consensus. There are people for and against this community in the community. Um, nothing was posted on the Whites Creek Facebook page or Hip Whites Creek or anything like that from social media about any of the community meetings that we had. And we'd like to see more transition area and you guys can put, um, put those extra requests on to, to change certain aspects but more transition area from rural to these areas. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, uh, rebuttal and then the council. Chairman, just a few thoughts. First, uh, one thing I neglected to mention when I was first up here, uh, even the staff will recognize that some of the uh, policy in this area is consistent with what we're proposing. As an example, you saw when the staff did a presentation, they showed the industrial piece. Uh, the staff will concur that that industrial piece is consistent with the policy. Some parts of our development are consistent even with the T3, uh, period. There's no dispute about that. With respect to other comments that were made here with listening to the opposition, they talked about they wanted a rural, comfortable uh, development. I don't know how you get any better than what you're looking at right here for that type of proposal. Uh, they talked about uh, there would be a problem uh, with crime, there'd be a problem with the density. You know, the density's half of what's currently allowed out there, uh, and I've said it twice already, but it's 303 versus 607, and the 607, 121 of those are duplexes. So you can't make a credible argument that this is more density, it's half, uh, and with respect to crime, it's a gated community which has been well received. With respect to the road connectivity and others, I want to mention that Deer Meadows was dealt with, they attended the meetings, they were supportive uh, and didn't want the traffic coming through them. Uh, that's, a, that's a neighborhood concern which is addressed here. The other thing that I'll mention is that the last person said that there's no access to the green space. That's totally incorrect. Every one of the pedestrian areas are open. They're not gated. The pedestrian access is open, so Deer Meadows, which is right here, and anybody that lives in that area has access to the site through walking trails, green paths. That's exactly what was proposed. That's what's committed to here. So I appreciate your courtesies. Uh, I believe that the matter should be approved as an interpretation of policy, and I appreciate your courtesies. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Council Lady? Thanks for coming down. My name is Council Lady Brenda Haywood, and first of all, I'd like to thank you for your time and your energy and your effort. I know what that feels like. I'd like to say that um, when I ran for office, I ran, I guess my mantra was, I would be the voice of the people. And uh, hopefully, unequivocally, I've tried to do that. And the reason I stand here in support of this development is because the majority of my constituents in that immediate area and somewhat beyond, they are excited about this development extremely. They said normally, uh, normally you don't get the type of housing that's coming and the, the quality is what they're excited about. They're just excited about it on every level. And uh, I've asked everyone to write in if they do not approve of this, if they're in favor of it. I think you've received several letters I have of people that could not um, appear tonight. I've worked very closely with the departments, including stormwater, to see that everything has been um, adhered to, to make sure that we follow all the guidelines. And I didn't find anything that wasn't um, followed by the letter. And so I'm just here to say that, the, <clears throat> pardon me, I've had a little bronchitis attack. Uh, <clears throat> but um, this is important to me. I was at the doctor's office yesterday just trying to feel well enough to come today because so many of my constituents are, again, unequivocally in favor 
of this development, and I just want to stand in support of it. Thank you. Thank you, Council. I appreciate you coming down. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, we declare the public hearing closed. Uh, Vice Chair, you want to go first? Uh, I'm kind of rusty. I haven't been here for a little while. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, uh, so, this is a, I, I have mixed feelings about this one. Um, I wanted one question or clarification. We saw the adjacent property not very long ago, right? It was a it was when we determined that the HUD was active. Is that correct? The one that goes up along. The, was it the grease plant that we saw when we had to determine that the yes, HUD. Yes, that's further down in White's Creek. Oh, it's the not south directly side of adjacent Riley. to it. Okay. Okay. I was just trying to um, orient myself a little bit here. Um, another sort of point of clarification question, and that relates to the statement about density. And I just wanted clarification again when we said that. Um, R10 would permit a maximum of 486 residential units. That's if it was no site constraints at all. But realistically, if with site constraints, we would see far fewer units in that area. I mean, that is the max density um, by the numbers. So like you said, I mean, there's always gonna be stream buffers, landscape buffer yards, roadways, required open space and those things. So, I mean, realistically, you probably wouldn't get that many, but you would, you would get a, a fair good amount. Okay, okay. I just wanted to kind of clarify the density. Um, you know, I, I fully recognize that we need more affordable housing and to get affordable housing with what's happening with land costs, um, you need density. So I understand the need for more density in this area. Um, but I don't understand exactly why we can't focus a little more on the connectivity and the sidewalks. And I think staff has even made it clear that um, the development pattern could be shifted a bit to make it work more with the existing character. Um, I mean, you state that the lot size is more appropriate in the maintenance areas, or the smaller lots could, be go, could go in the area where there's an evolving policy and larger lots would go in the maintenance areas, and right now that's flipped. So, you know, it sounds like there's been a lot of conversations with staff, but I'm not sure why that suggestion or guidance wasn't, you know, included. Um, so it seems like there may be a way to make this work better and meet some of the requirements. Um, you know, on the connectivity side, I, I, that is a really important point. And one of the reasons when we improve stub streets and subdivisions is because we always think what's coming next and if, if we continue to allow them not to have connectivity, we're kind of defeating ourselves. Um, and I think to the point that the um, community members said, you know, we're setting a precedent. There's a lot of open space in this area that could be redeveloped. And if we set this precedent where we're going against policy, not encouraging connectivity, and we have sidewalk issues, I think we're setting a dangerous precedent for redevelopment in this entire area. And I don't think some of those same goals in terms of um, affordability and, you know, making productive use of the space couldn't be accomplished in a different manner. So I don't know if I'm in favor of a deferral to reconsider the plan or supporting the staff's recommendation for disapproval, but um, that's where I stand now. Commissioner Tibbs. Um, I, I actually, I'm, I'm okay even with the lot size and the configuration and the density, but the connectivity does bother me as well. And why was the reason for the gated part? I don't, I'm sorry if I missed that, why it was gated? We can ask uh, Mr. White, do you have a response? Most of the input that was received from the neighborhood meetings was that uh, Deer Meadows has been there a significant number of decades, and there was a real interest by them in not having traffic coming through their development. Uh, that was part of it, and the community input was in trying to get an upgrade for the type of housing there, and I think you've seen what's been done right next door to has been incredibly well received. Uh, that a gated community was what the community wanted. I mean, the client went in there, they've done other things not gated in the area. It was driven by 
the response we received from the community, uh, period. But the key was they wanted pedestrian access, and there's no limitation on the pedestrian access from Deer Meadows or any place else in the community. That's how it came about. Mr. Tibbs? Okay. Um, I'd, that's the, still a kind of a, well, the connectivity is still an issue for me. The, the, there is a lot of opportunities for it, and um, the gate, it's still kind of, to me, um, you can have a sidewalk you can walk over, but a gated community gives a perception that this community is not part of the rest of the community. And um, I'm, I, you know, I would question that, I guess, is all of a sudden those, you know, that area is not part of my area. So so the gated part is uh, an issue with me. And, and like I said, I feel like it should be more a continuity part of it. The density, and like uh, Commissioner Farr said, it's kind of good to have these areas that, are, that you can have more affordable areas. So even the configuration doesn't bother me as much as just uh, those two aspects. So I, like I said, I don't know if it's a deferral or what, but it's the connectivity of, I, I feel like that would make this, you know, at least something I would feel comfortable with. Commissioner Blackshear. Um, well, this certainly is a policy question to Mr. White's point and whether we feel like the um, proposal does meet policy. And there's been conversation about the lot sizes and the um, placement of the lot sizes. Perhaps if they were switched, maybe they would be consistent with policy, um, but it does not seem in the configuration of the policy areas as they stand. It doesn't seem like the lot sizes um, in the proposal that we have currently in front of us are consistent with the policy. Um, the larger question, of course, would be um, the connectivity point that the prior two commissioners spoke about. If both policies that are um, applicable in this area, which would be neighborhood maintenance and neighborhood evolving, call for um, the enhancement of public street connectivity, and we have certainly um, it doesn't appear that there's any way to really conceive of this development as enhancing public street connectivity, then it, to me, would clearly be inconsistent with policy, with, with whichever policy that you were looking at. And if it's not consistent with policy, then it's just a, um, an item that we are unable to approve. So, um, for, I mean, I, I do actually have a problem with the placement of the lots, but even if I didn't, the public street connectivity point to me would be a reason that I would not be able to support um, this proposal as it's currently before us. Commissioner Bichelle. Um, could I see this slide with the connectivity circles on it, the um, points that it could have been connected, that it wasn't? Um, so some of those, a few of those go right into open space, and I could understand why those wouldn't be considered, but the other ones seem pretty straightforward to be connecting to these neighborhoods. And um, has the developer, uh, has? I, I didn't see any letters from community members on this issue. Um, the developer says that, the community weighed in, and this was really something they were strongly opposed to, this connectivity, but it seems like there's a compromise there in the works. Um, that's one thing that would make me think that I would be more interested in deferral to try to work that out. Um, the other thing is the, the open space. Is that open space picked um, because it's difficult to build on, or is it picked because it's a buffer for these areas? Um, is there a compromise, like Commissioner Blackshear talked about, where some of these sections could be moved around to fit in policy? Um, I didn't see any letters or comments from community against that. So it seems like there's room for compromise here. Um, I, would, I would pick deferral. Councilman? How much time do I have? <laughs> as much time as you need. I mean, I want to talk about connectivity, all right? We all talk about connectivity uh, planning, uh, somehow went down that road about connecting neighborhoods as a way to improve the traffic flow through the city. The problem with that concept is that it relies with enforcement. 
and we don't have good enforcement on speeding through neighborhoods. So what happens in suburban Nashville is that people are rebelling to that idea because uh, with the advent of GPS, uh, people are cutting through neighborhoods going at the same speed that they will go on a main corridor. So what you see, at least in my district, is that uh, people are coming on Orangeville Road at 50, 60 miles an hour. Uh, the school is uh, letting kids in and out, so they cut through Sunnywood and they go 50, 60 miles an hour on a suburban 30 miles an hour road. So I get this question all the time. They don't want connectivity. I know why we do it uh, from a design perspective, but without enforcement, it's just not, not working. So I, in the council, I propose, let's create a suburban traffic enforcement force, right? And I talked to the police, I got all the prices, how much will it cost to hire the people to do it, and I couldn't get my peers in the council to fund this idea. And I wanted to start with a, um, with a simple you know, pilot program. <coughs> it's very hard to design something that relies on something else to happen, and then the something else doesn't happen. So I think that's the Achilles heel of this connectivity concept, that unless we, we strongly enforce the speed limit through the neighborhoods, it's just, it's just going to continue coming back to us where people are going to be asking like things like this. I don't want to be connected. And I had that happen to me on Burkett Road. A subdivision says, I don't want to be connected to this new place. And so they end up doing those crash gates so the fire department could actually come in in case, case of a fire. So this is one of those things where, uh, as a city, you know, we subdivide into silos, and then we are tasking the planning department to come up with good planning solutions, but the other silo is not actually supporting uh, what it needs to happen for this silo to work. Am I making sense? So all that to say, I understand uh, why they're asking to have this gated community. I don't take it as, I don't want to mix up with those people. I take it more like I'm concerned about having a guy that is, uh, doesn't want to go through that road to come speeding through my neighborhood. Uh, that's the way I look at it. Councilman, if I may, I just want to make sure, I agree with you on the enforcement side that that's a critical piece. I think, though, that the connectivity piece is about traffic, but it's also about dispersing traffic in a way that creates more open environments for people. So I think that if you, I think that if we cut off certain roads, it un invariably affects traffic in one location, but it creates choke points elsewhere. And so part of our challenge here, I, I agree w with many of your comments, I think part of the challenge here is looking holistically at the street network and at the, the pattern of development and figuring out um, how they link together. And and what one home feels at one location is um, of equal importance to how another street elsewhere feels, but they're all, we're all using the same space. I think that you mentioned the, the fire, and that's important too, because we have a history in Nashville of creating subdivisions on one access point that have more homes than are currently permitted by fire standards today. And so it is a it is an issue to try to figure out as we fill in gaps between neighborhoods to try to cre create complete <coughs> communities, how we do that in a way that matches the character of a community, enhances it, but also is safe. And so I just would add that to the policy question you posed about enforcement is sort of that broader question about how we how we can do that, and I, I think connectivity is a, a yeah, piece. Yeah, and, and I understand yeah. exact. I, I know what, you, what mm -hmm. we're trying to do is a good thing, yeah. but we are asking Nashville to do a leap of faith and believe that we are also going to be doing the enforcement. And unless, and this, this is not a planning thing. I mean, I, I'm just saying, as a city, we have to. Why we don't have enough fire stations, right? I mean. If we don't have enough fire station, it's going to be harder for all these fires to be put out. So having more gates into a community when we don't have the fire station to support that, I, it's not a planning issue. I'm just trying to make the case here that what you're getting from the community as pushback on, on connectivity is because they are frustrated. No, I don't think we're planning. Planning will be like the symptom of what they see, something that they can control. 
So that's why I say if you have half an hour, because this is one of those things that, as a councilman, I can see the, the big picture and, uh, well, I don't know if I can see big, I try to see the big picture, let me put it that way. Uh, so having said that, uh, I, I think in this case, uh, if the neighbors uh, want us to accept the guided community so they can control some of the traffic, I'll, I'll be okay with that. Uh, Long explanation. Sorry about that. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman. Commissioner Gallo. This is an extremely complex request on an extremely complex piece of property, and to take this on at five o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> is tough, uh, especially those of us who don't have the stamina that we <laughs> once had. Um, I kind of agree with the other commissioners. I think. It, all the pieces and parts here should be able to work. I'm concerned with the policy issues and the precedent that goes along with with that. I am, uh, I've only been on this commission for 18 months, 19 months, and uh, not come across no sidewalks before, I don't think. Uh, and we've got pedestrian connectivity, but no sidewalks. So I don't know how that works. Um, but I think the solutions are all there. But I, uh, with deferral or something where these solutions could be worked out, seems logical to me. Commissioner Sims? I have a question about the community involvement and really appreciate you, Councilwoman, what you've done there. Um, but we got a letter and we also had someone speak to us that said they had no community meeting. Um, and I'm wondering about how the people that were involved in the community meeting were chosen, how many actually showed up, what kind of representative voices those were for the neighborhoods. Well, first of all, we had in excess of four community meetings, and uh, we, I have the council office to send out notifications at least 1,000 feet from the area, we're required to send out uh, 600 feet, but I always send out beyond that based on where the uh, development is located. And so uh, we, uh, I call people, we send out community uh, notices. And also, uh, it's a little bit troubling because all of 2018, the third Saturday in every month, I have a community meeting. Um, I had a community meeting every third Saturday and every month at Parkwood Community Center. And um, it's very easy to get in touch with me, to find me, to reach out to me. I even, um, I go to the schools in the area. Randy Dow reached out. I went and spoke to him and had a lot of the parents over there to talk about affordable housing. But to be specific in answering your question, the council office sends out notices. I even walk in the district to give out notices of people that could have possibly missed it. But um, I spent a great deal of time and effort in reaching out to vet the different developments. I hope that answered your question. That very much did so. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I think with that, that was my major concern is when we do get both people telling us in letters saying that they didn't get communicated to, I want to make sure they did. So thank you. Ms. Haynes. Um, all my comments have been covered. I, I do think this has the possibility of being right and we're not completely there yet. So I would also support a deferral. So just uh, my recommendation then if it's the consensus of the commission would be a two meeting deferral. Um, and whoever wants to make the motion, I would include the items that I've heard include um, sidewalks, connectivity, lot sizes as the three primary things that you would want. I'm sorry, come in. And the ad policy adher adherence um, as that, that will help staff in our, during that time, be able to work productively with the applicant. And you have the window in terms of where this is with council? Thank you. Good. Thank you. That's good. I, um, just to confirm, has there been a council bill introduced? No. Okay. So it was not listed. Okay. Well, and as a courtesy, we generally ask the applicant, would a two-meeting deferral be? Chairman, with the greatest respect, we would not want this matter deferred. We've been working on this for six to nine months. I've heard the comments. 
I'll commit to the commission that at the uh, council level, we fully expect to have further discussions that may end up modifying the current plan, but uh, with the greatest respect, we spent enough time uh, that we would prefer that it be disapproved today. We like an approval, frankly, but uh, understanding the comments that I've heard, a lot of which are constructive, uh, we respectfully ask that it be disapproved today so we can move forward to the council level. And normally this commission takes the deferral request, yes or no, from the applicant, and I'm respectfully asking that it not be deferred. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wright. So you've, so the commission has heard the arguments on both sides, and y'all, but there needs to be a motion, so. Is there a... I'll make no, a motion to support staff's recommendation of disapproval. Second. That's a proper motion. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the disapproval, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no? Ayes have it. It's disapproved. Council Lee, thank you for coming down, and uh, we appreciate it, and um, I appreciate all of your community outreach. So <laughs> thank you very much. All right, so we've been... We've only done one item. I think, I think, commissioners, if we did one more and then potentially took a break, would that be okay with you guys? All right, seeing no objection, we're on item number nine. All right, item number nine is a zone change request for 1804 and 1806 Lishy Avenue. The request is to change zoning from RS5, which is a single family residential only zoning, to RM20, which is a multifamily residential zoning. The properties are highlighted in red. They are located along the western side of Lishy Avenue, just south of East Trinity Lane in East Nashville. Staff's recommendation is to disapprove. Current zoning is RS5, that single family residential zoning. RS5 zoning is to the south, to the west and to the east. North is SP zoning for residential uses. Th these properties are located in the T4 urban neighborhood evolving policy area and within the Highland Heights study area. <coughs> Excuse me. As you recall, the Highland Heights study supplemental policy was recently approved and adopted by the Planning Commission on June 14th. There was extensive community engagement. This established a supplementary building, regulate, building regulate, regulating plan, pardon me, and mobility plan. The, the community character policy for this site was at that time neighborhood evolving. It did not change with the adoption of the Highland Heights plan. The building regulating plan um, identifies these, this site here highlighted in red um, within the R4 subdistrict, and that supports a range of residential uses including two-family, multi-family residential, depending on the location and context and presence of infrastructure. The properties across Lishy Avenue, over here, highlighted in yellow, are identified as T4 Urban Neighborhood Maintenance Policy and within the T, I'm sorry, the R3 subdistrict, which is intended to maintain the existing low and moderate density, predominantly single-family and residential. <coughs> The Highland Heights study also introduced the mobility plan. Lishy Avenue, here highlighted in purple, is identified as a collector avenue street. The parcels we're talking about are in yellow here. This street has MTA stops and uh, lines on it. This mobility plan identifies the need for an alley, oh, where did my mouse go, sorry, right here, with this dashed line, on the southern property line of 1804 Lishy Avenue. At this location, the R4 subdistrict area was envisioned to accommodate additional density with the installation of an alley along that southern property line of 1804 Lishy Avenue right there. There's no existing alley right of way at this location. RM20 zoning does not require the dedication of alley right of way or the construction of the alley that was identified as a need in the Highland Heights study. Without the alley infrastructure, prescribed in the mobility plan, the request is inappropriate. Therefore, staff recommendation is to, is to disapprove as this request is inconsistent with the goals of the T4 Urban Neighborhood Evolving Policy and the Highland Heights Supplemental Policy. Thank you. We'll open this item for public hearing and is the applicant in the room? Come on up. You have 10 minutes 
and you can save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal if you'd like. Welcome. Okay. Please state your name and address for the record. Good evening, Planning Commission. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, my name is Jessica Williams. I am a resident of District 5. I live in Fifth and Main Condos. Um, I am here today because this is my first development project. I've been working on it for the last two years. Um, I own a real estate brokerage, and our main goal has always been to help people be able to build wealth and to be able to help communities come together and grow. And so, while I have taken a focus to learn about smart growth development, really be able to see communities come together, I wanted to be able to create an affordable housing opportunity. Um, I have a passion to be able to see people own homes as I've had the opportunity to be able to, and I know that that $150,000 price point these days just simply don't exist. And I wanted to be able to give people the same um, the same opportunity that I had um, today. And so I came across these two beautiful properties that are 2.3 acres. And when we originally submitted our RM20 request, it was with almost 40 other acres included in it. Um, we spoke with the community, we spoke with the neighbors, we've gone to, I was also had an opportunity to be a part of the, uh, the charrette process. I was on the steering committee. Um, we spoke a lot with the stakeholders, the planning team, and we began to figure out what does this whole Highland Heights look like. Um, and through that character policy on those 2.3 acres, an RM20 was a recommendation that would support higher density in that northwest corner. And so I feel that the my request to ask for RM20 is definitely within the character policy, and I'm just asking that that be supported. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll reserve two minutes for your rebuttal, okay? Is there anyone in the audience wishing to speak in support? Say support. Come on up. Welcome. And you have two minutes. Please state your name and address. My name is David Scales. My address is 4616 Setter Court. And um, this uh, 1806 property uh, was owned by my mother, and I pretty much uh, cared for the ground for 20 plus years. And um, I'm in support of the uh, zone changing. Um, I'm just here to say that um, uh, these two properties, uh, the property next door to it, they really run pretty deep back off the street. and. Um, I just think this property, these properties could be used to um, help the progress of uh, Nashville and within the um, the standards of, of uh, the building codes and all that. And so I just want to say I'm in favor of it. Thank you, sir. Okay. Appreciate you coming down. Anyone else? Come on up. We love when former staff team members come. And I love well, coming up here to support applications. Dwayne Cuthbertson, 2814 12th Avenue South. <clears throat> I just wanted to briefly speak in support of um, the zone change in general. Um, I'm supportive of density in this neighborhood. This is a neighborhood that's got great infrastructure. Uh, the connectivity issue specific to this property notwithstanding, uh, I am in support of this type of change in this neighborhood. I think it provides a lot of opportunity <clears throat> to satisfy a lot of the goals that we talk about day in, year in, year out. And uh, so I just wanted to step up and send my support for this property. Thank you, sir. Okay. Appreciate it. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? We'll make sure we get everybody. Seeing no one else in support, anyone in opposition? Come on up. Welcome. Good evening, Commissioners. Happy New Year. Uh, my name is Gordon Stacy Harmon. I reside at 1826 Joy Circle. As the chairperson for the Highland Heights Neighborhood Association, I would like to request additional time for comments. Five minutes. Thank you. Earlier today, I sent comments via email to be included in your information for this case. I'd like to make note of those concerns that I voiced, as well as add the voices of other neighbors in the area. 
At our November steering committee meeting, Ms. Williams attended and was given the opportunity to present the plans for these two lots. At the time, she had no specific plans to share other than the owners were wanting to rezone to RM20. Since she had nothing of significance to present, an invitation was extended to return and present plans when she had more info. At no time has a request been made to present any of this to the general membership. She did attend our January 2nd steering committee meeting, but had no substantial additional info to provide other than they would like to construct 46 units in a mixture of condo and townhouse style buildings. We then shared our concerns with her, and those members of the steering committee present specifically called out the following concerns and issues. One, density. This project is required, uh, is requesting the highest density allowable in the R4 subdistrict, which is denser than the approved in the SP to the immediate north. It's the 1801 Meridian case, which was approximately 18 units per acre. Access is point number two. How will residents in this development access their homes? How will emergency vehicles gain access? Move around, exit the property. Placement of these access points will impact traffic on Lishy. If an alley is constructed along the southernmost border, will that be solely on the private property or will residents whose property front Edith Avenue be granted right of way usage? Point three, short term rentals. RM20 allows for permit application of units as short-term rentals. It's a huge concern for many residents in our neighborhood as we've already seen an increase in housing stock being turned into short-term rentals. If our need in this city is so great for housing, we should not be building units originally presented as housing that then turn into ad hoc hotels. Point number four, tree canopy. The property con currently contains several old growth trees that may need to be removed. Aside from the landscaping regulations, there's no guarantee that trees of a comparable species or comparable quantity will replace those removed. Planning staff has made the recommendation based on these density and access points, and I must say I agree with their analysis. What has become quite evident to those of us who have had an audience with Ms. Williams is there are no specific plans for this development, and that's a great concern. Not only are there no specific plans, but no agreements the neighborhood may enter concerning this development are binding. RM20 doesn't require, nor does it protect, any such agreements. Should this property be sold to a new owner before development, there's nothing in place to honor any previous agreements. Even the argument of a homeowners association governing rules preventing short-term rentals can be changed with a simple bylaws update as RM20 would still allow it. The neighborhoods surrounding that development would have no basis to counter. I personally have encouraged the owners and developer to consider changing their application to SPR so these concerns could be addressed in a way that would be binding and considerate of the neighborhood's feelings. The response has been that changing to SP would be too costly and continue to delay the project. If the owners and developer have any concern about the feeling of the neighbors in the community, they would give this path another thought. To think the cheapest option for the greatest density is their biggest concern makes one wonder if costs are their only true concern. One last point. According to our neighborhood study and subsequent amendment, RM20 is not even an allowable zoning in the R4 subdistrict. RM20A might be possible, but those two are not interchangeable. Thank you for your, for your time, and I hope you side with the staff on this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Okay, you know the drill. Yeah. I know the drill. Shanti Davis, 321 Edwin Street. I live a little less than a block from the site of these two properties. I actually walk by them every day. Um, so I'm here to say something I typically don't say is I'm in support of staff's recommendation on this one. And I'm in support of it because I think what the applicant misunderstands about saying that this is within policy. What was different about our charrette was that not only is there a policy, there's a supplemental policy that works with it. And that provides more guidance to sort of help you know, lead how development will look in this neighborhood. This particular, these two particular properties are very deep and long, and they're sort of in a strange interchange of behind it, there's a lot of density. To the south of it, there's only, there's very little density, and then to the north of it, there's a bunch of single family homes as well, which is where I live. Um, so I think there is a misunderstanding about the policy, which is why I support staff's recommendation. And then the second thing I wanted to touch on, the reason why I think staff recommended this is because we do have an infrastructure problem as someone who has a drainage ditch in front of our house, who does not have a sidewalk, whose sewer line has to be remanned, like they come and clean the hole once every eight months. We have real infrastructure issues, and I think that's why the staff has recommended a specific plan so that you can address those infrastructure issues, you can address, address alley access, you can address all of those things and not just do a straight zone change, which we've seen the problems resulting from that. So 
I think these two properties are ripe for redevelopment. I would not be against a denser development on these two properties, so you can quote me that I did say that. I'm not saying that it has to be a single family redevelopment, but I, what I am saying is whatever goes on these properties should be congruent with the surrounding context, and that's why I support staff's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Hi there, commissioners. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your service. Uh, my name is Daniel Pratt. I live at 342 Edith. It's directly south of 1804 Lishy. And uh, I've lived there for about three years. My family bought the house three years ago. And I'm, I'm deeply concerned about any development beyond single family homes on these properties, specifically because uh, from a personal standpoint, my home is is mere feet away from the southern property line of 1804, Lishi. I can see out my back, uh, my back window and my back door into that backyard. If that becomes an alley, I've got trucks, people, who knows, foot traffic, garbage uh, directly out my back door and my, my back window. And that's, that's deeply concerning to me. That would affect my comfort in my own home. Uh, there's already some larceny issues in our neighborhood. I can only imagine that that alley would give uh, give us more opportunity for that kind of thing. Um, I, I love my neighborhood. I love my neighbors. Uh, I believe that it should our neighborhood should maintain that single family vibe. Uh, that's why I greatly urge the commission to disapprove. And I uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you coming down. Come on up, man. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Martha Carroll. I live at uh, 325 Gatewood. Uh, I was the former chair of the Highland Heights Neighborhood Association when we went through the charrette, uh, a process that I'm uh, deeply appreciative of. Uh, I don't have a whole lot more to add to this conversation, except to say that uh, at that June meeting where uh, some changes were made, uh, the planning uh, the planning staff had done quite a lot uh, to make the changes and, and worked closely with developers and with uh, neighborhood folks. And I remember Ms. Williams was at that meeting and uh, we voted yes uh, to those recommendations and to those specific changes. Um, infrastructure is a huge problem. If you live in that area, you know that infrastructure is a problem and we have not really uh, address those, and I don't expect you all to do that. I'm just saying that those things have not yet been resolved. Um, the other thing that I just want to add is there have been developers who have come in and had real conversations with us, and we have hashed out these things point by point. And then there are others where, well, the plan is vague and probably the property is going to be sold after the zoning change and so there's no real way to get a handle on it um, so i just would like to say that that collaboration is an essential step i'm all for uh, something being built on that property i don't have any problem with increased density myself i think that's just essential for affordable housing but i think that that piece that involves a lot of collaborating and conversation is missing Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome. Hello, my name is Ray Sovereign. I live at 1602 Lichy Avenue, which is about two blocks from this property. And um, I agree with the staff, re staff recommendation to disapprove for this. Um, we, as the other folks have said, we've been around this bush a couple of times with this developer and expected good faith um, cooperation and dialogue, and that doesn't seem to be happening um, in this particular piece. Um, and so um, 
hopefully through the disapproval and more negotiations, they'll come back, they'll come back with a plan, they'll come back with something that is in character to both what the staff recommended in our charrette and also um, what the majority of the people in our neighborhood want. We're, we're getting close-knit, we're knowing what other folks' interests are and what their concerns are, and we're trying to make it as equitable and um, transparent as possible. Uh, cooperation on the part of our council people and also developers that come to us is um, highly uh, uh, desired on the part of them communicating with the neighborhood association and the neighbors themselves. So I, I uh, am in support of the staff recommendation to disapprove and would like to see this resolved in a way that is beneficial to the entire neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? I don't see anything, anyone else. So how about we'll get the rebuttal and then um, the councilman. So come on up. Then councilman, you go last, okay? All right. Hello. Um, so I want to address not coming to council meeting or coming to community meetings. I have been to these community meetings at least over seven times. I've written the vice president of um, Highland Heights asking on two occasions if I can come and present what we have going on so we can kind of get the conversation going. No response. When they did respond, they told me, come to Thursday's meeting. I come Thursday. No one's there. Next month, come next Thursday to our, to our steering committee meeting. I come no one's there. So there's been at least two occasions where I've been told to come, but no one has showed up. I've been definitely trying to engage um, with the community, absolutely, as well as planning, trying to figure out what's the best way to address this. I have been in this process for two years now. Had we ever spoken about an SP at the front end, it might have been a different conversation. But you have two years later where we've worked um, faithfully with the owners, have closed on those properties, have paid a premium for those properties um, without a rezone in place because they're, we're no longer waiting to uh, wait. I know that may not be something that means anything to the community, but from our standpoint, and they speak about spending money, we've, we've already spent a substantial amount of money with the homeowner um, buying those properties and working with them. And so it's not a case of not wanting to, to spend per se, it's the fact that time is money and we've been here for two years and we've been around the block over and over again. And I have been willing to show up, show my face, speak with them, and I continue to get the same thing over and over again. And at the point when they finally did decide that they might consider it, when staff did do the approval, they went back to the other side. So. This is my experience, and I don't. And I want them to understand that I am willing to work with them as I have been, um, but that I, I'm not missing in action. So, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Councilman. Welcome. Thank you, everybody. Um, for your alertness and being and paying attention. I'm going to say something, maybe a little bit out of my character, okay? I'm asking you to support the disapproval. You know, go play those lotto tickets. And I'm asking you to support the disapproval for a few reasons. And I could be wrong, but when it comes to the alley, you know, I don't, I don't think the alley is important. However, I must consider what my neighbor said because he'll have to deal with it on his end. So I don't think the community will find a way with the alley. However, though, with other infrastructure improvements, we can. And I just have a quick question in the middle of my statement. Um, technically, um, and this may be a question for a lawyer also for my chair of the, of the council's um, planning committee too or whoever knows the answer. I just want to double check. Um, by doing, so getting a disapproved bill helps me because then I can add all those infrastructure things, maybe not the alley because some areas may be upset. I can play with the, play with the um, density 
also could do some other things with it. And what the question I wanna ask by, by bringing a substitute, you know, because the community meeting is next Thursday, and the developer come there, get all the things, infrastructure-wise, get the community agreement in place, and, you know, do that affordable housing piece that the, in writing that the councilman is going to force down her throat. Um, but the main thing, though, is, you know, by disapproving this tonight, please disapprove it. Don't defer, disapprove. And what we're going to do is, you know, you'll probably have a substitute in your near future. And this gets the power to um, maybe not get everything, because I don't think we're going to get an agreement on the alley with some of the neighbors, and I think we can live with that. But as far as the infrastructure and the unit count, uh, we'll probably could work something out there. And also with adding of sidewalks and some drainage and some other stuff. So, you know, I'm asking you to please disapprove, disapprove this tonight. <laughs> So just to unpack that a little bit, I think that staff early on had recommended a site-specific plan here um, so that infrastructure and land uses and density could all be taken together. And with a specific plan, we can require sidewalks. The alley from our, our vantage point is an important component of managing the density from a um, traffic and a pedestrian and vehicular access perspective. So. I think to your question, um, we can't get some of that infrastructure with a straight zone change as part of the entitlement process, if that's the question. Typically when there is, um, when we send our recommendation to council, approval or disapproval, if you, um, if the council member determines that um, he or she wants to make substantive changes that increase the density, usually that comes back to planning. Um, and so, but if not, and you're, you're not adding intensity, um, then that can occur at the council level. If that, does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. that, yes that does. Um, and, you know, I, I hope you know all of the years that working with a lot of you, that I definitely respect your opinion, sure. okay? Definitely, definitely do that, you know? Okay. But I'm more concerned with, the, um, with um, certain other issues in the community you know, as far as some infrastructures and then the alley, because I don't think we can get an agreement on certain alley issues, you know, with the, with some of the neighbors. So, um, Just to clarify though on the alley, was the alley included in the charrette process that occurred with the community? Um, yeah, the mobility plan was a part of the um, the process, and the this would be it's an alley network, mm -hmm. and so um, getting the alley may mean having to look at a broader area as well. So the alley goes through a portion of this. But because that was carefully vetted, it, you might take that into account once this comes to council in terms of community support. This did go through a more extensive public engagement process than some some of the SPs that we we might look at. I so know. you might give that some weight also. I know, yeah, and I and and I will. And it's it is with a very reluctant heart that we may not come to agreement on the alley because. But you, but I'm glad my neighbor came and said that he's not in favor of it. You know what I mean? And some other stuff. I think we can get there. And I'm going to ask. You know, Jessica, to come back to her neighbors, get a list of everything that they're they're looking at as far as the infrastructure and and other stuff, and then I'm going to make her do that evil mean councilman affordable housing stuff, and you know AMI and all that great stuff that we all know about, and we're look, probably looking at a substitute bill, you know that will be for your desk. So please, uh, please uphold the disapproval, and. Let's move on, and we're going to revisit this and thank have you. several more neighborhood meetings. And just want to thank my neighbors for coming out in support and in against. And I look forward to seeing everybody again. God bless you all. Thank you, Council. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, we'll declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Haynes, you want to go first? So 2019 is going to be a good year. If we are in agreement with Ms. Davis and the councilman, this is going to be a really good year. <laughs> um, I think staff's analysis is right on, and I will support staff's recommendation. Commissioner Sims. I always do what Jeff tells me. <laughs> no, I'm very much in support of it. Commissioner Gavel. I agree with the staff. Councilman. Mm -hmm. 
Commissioner. Anyone else wishing to speak? You want to try to, Commissioner request. Michelle? Yes, perfect. <laughs> Could you please tell me the difference between RM20 and RM20A? Sure. So RM, so the A for the A districts is an alternative district. It essentially establishes some base level design guidelines um, in regards to uh, requiring raised foundations of buildings along public streets. They have build two zones as opposed to setback um, requirements on fronts. Um, they also require a certain percentage of glazing. And if within the UZO, they have standards for uh, parking and to be located behind buildings buildings or to the sides of buildings. Um, additionally, for RM20, on the height, it's a height control plane, and so what you're looking at is that as you move further away from a street or a setback, you can go up higher, and so um, as opposed to RM20A, which has uh, base heights. <coughs> okay, so... Um it seems, I would agree with staff on this, but it does seem like there are um, really good reasons to disapprove of this, um, and I hope that that's taken into account in the next um, negotiations. Commissioner Blackshear. Um, yeah, I had a question just about the whole legislative process. So a straight zone change, which obviously this is requested to be, would not require the infrastructure improvements. Is that right? That's correct. So, you, so usually after a straight zone change will go through council, and then at some point down the road there will be a permit. Right. And it's possible that public works could require some improvements at that point, but it's just treated differently. We don't know what those are up front. SP inc usually includes conditions from all the reviewing agencies that clearly lays out what type of infrastructure would be required to support the proposal, which is a little different. So you know some of that uh, infrastructure up front. Right. No, that, that makes sense. So the substitute bill that the council Councilman was referring to, it sounded like he was envisioning an SP and not a straight zone change. I wouldn't presume to know if it would be an SP, but it did sound like it would include some specific standards. And so we have seen instances where council will convert something um, at council to a different um, a different proposal or a different zone category. And so I understand that if the... Um, you mentioned that if density were to increase, that would have to come back. But if this were converted from a straight zone change to an SP, would that come back before us? Can st staff, can you give a little clarity? I mean, typically the rule is just starting with the base. Um, if this planning commission, to set this project aside, if this planning con commission approves a proposal with certain uses, um, intensities, access points, for example. We send our recommendation to council, and then council increases the uh, acreage or increases or substantively changes the proposal, it will be referred back to us. That's the baseline principle. Now you're asking a slightly different question, I think, if staff can answer, at least has a little, probably a little more detailed knowledge of the council rules, but if something is amended on third, for example, that may not be referred back to us. And it also depends on what the change is. And so, for instance, we have seen before, um, say, rezonings that have been recommended for disapproval um, because it's a commercial use in a residential policy. At the council level, they may substitute it to an SP, like a straight zone, they may substitute an SP to prohibit certain uses, but it's still a commercial use. It would still be disapproval, so that wouldn't be something that would necessarily be referred back to us because it's not changing the substance of it. Um, and so it's really, uh, you know. Hold on one second. Yes. We, uh, if anybody gets a call, we need to make sure that, take it outside the chamber because we, we can't hear the conversation. I know the citizens can't. So if you get a call, please take it in the hallway. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Sorry to interrupt. It's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. And so there are other cases where maybe an, uh, a project comes through and the change is a substantive one where uh, where it would maybe be like we had recommended disapproval of RM20, but then an SP, it's converted to an SP, and it includes some standards for connectivity or infrastructure, and that may be something that we would be um, need to be re-referred, there's not a black and white yes or no. It really is um, project to project. 
That's helpful. Although, I mean, obviously, we don't know what will happen. Um, so to the- But we will look at it. Okay. To the applicant's point um, about the, the zone change versus the SP and then the timing of just that um, advice, because she has spent a lot of money and time, and it sounded like, and I could be misstating you, it sounded like she gets this um, advice to go the SP route after she's already invested quite a bit of time and money planning for the RM20. So how does that happen? Like, how do we make sure that, I mean, you may have, I, I don't know the timing of it all, but how do we make sure that the developers get um, what planning's advice would be early enough on in the process? So our hope and is and wish is always that we consult early and often in the development review process. Um, I can't <laughs> say that it always happens, um, but we make every effort to meet with applicants. We have lots of pre-apps for um, projects, especially in areas that are expensing, experiencing a lot of change, um, like this one. So I regret that you know there was a period of time that um, this applicant went and inv made investments without knowing what the requirements would be. I think in this instance, it's a little complex because Highland Heights had experienced some change. And then um, we they came and asked for a policy amendment. There were several policy amendments, as y'all recall, in this area. And then we had a pretty detailed charrette last year. And so I think we can expect that as part of that process, our understanding and direction in the area has evolved. And we've tried to refine um, our goals based on the community's input as well as our own planning principles. And so um, undoubtedly you've got, you know, projects that were, you know, in process and in development that were brought into that puzzle. And so um, I'm sure that the that the guidance has been um, has been has refined since then. So, but we do try to let people know as early as possible if we think an SP is the only route um, to to successfully accomplishing a project. Anything else, Commissioner? Commissioner Tibbs. Commissioner Farr. Um, I, Commissioner Blackshear really posed my question. I, I, am I correct that the whole property? above this is part of a specific plan? Mm -hmm. And we didn't incorporate, I'm just, I mean, I'm just trying to visualize like what, what what's Can you show the there? area again that and includes that SP that we reviewed maybe a year and a half ago? So this is the plan for the SP that's just north of the properties. These are the two properties we were talking about today. Okay, so that will sort of create a context at some point for how those two lots get redeveloped, okay. That helps because yes. it's a strange piece of property. It is, and they, uh, this was taken into account during the charrette process, looking at the unique configuration of the site and how, you know, to the north you've got an area of, of more density, but to the south you have more of a single family mm -hmm. character and trying to figure out what the right design approach is. Yeah, no, I feel even more strongly that a specific plan is right looking at that and then trying to figure out how you manage that tr transition. So I'll make a motion that we support staff's recommendation for disapproval and... That's a proper motion. Second. A, and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of disapproval say aye. Aye. Opposed no, ayes have it and we'll adopt the staff's recommendation disapproval. Appreciate everybody coming down. And so now I believe we've been meeting for about two hours. We probably need to take a, a quick break. We've got items 15, 32, and 33 left. And we'll take, without objection, we'll take a quick 10 minute break. I do want to thank everybody for letting us go on a little break. Uh, and uh, we appreciate that very much. So we are on, on item. So we have, for everybody in the audience, we, are, we have items 15, 32, and 33 left. And we're on item, item 15. Sean? All right. Um, item 15 is a proposal to amend the text of the zoning code, um, specifically various sections of chapter 17.24, um, which is the landscaping, buffering, and trees section of the zoning ordinance. Um, this slide lists the various sections that would be amended um, and has kind of a summary of the changes in each of those sections. But generally, the, the changes are focused on um, increasing tree density 
um, adding some locational requirements and eliminating some exemptions, um, all generally aimed at the goal of um, protecting and enhancing Nashville's tree canopy, um, which is a, a priority in Nashville next for all of the various benefits that the tree canopy um, provides both environmentally and in terms of beautification and um, making this a livable city. Um, this has been an ongoing um, effort of several council members, um, and they have um, proposed these changes um, as part of a process of incremental improvements to the ordinance. So this is a um, minor collection of changes um, to, to begin to move things forward. Um, staff is recommending approval of a substitute. Um, there are drawings in the current version of the code that illustrate many of the code requirements. Um, over time, those original drawings have become um, blurry and out of scale as they've been replicated. So those have been reproduced um, using CAD so that they will be clear and scalable. Um, and they're intended to be consistent with the drawings that are already there. Following publication of the staff report, um, there were some, some errors, some typographical errors that were identified. Um, so staff has already begun working with the illustrator and the council office to make sure those are corrected um, so that the drawings, um, as recommended, will be absolutely consistent with what is already in the code. Um, so because the overall proposed changes are um, generally aimed at the goal of protecting and retaining and enhancing Nashville's tree canopy, which is a goal of Nashville Next, um, staff is recommending approval, again, just with the substitute for the images. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing um, and the applicant, uh, which is really, I believe, the council lady. Um, you want to come on up and um, we appreciate you coming down. And then we'll also reserve time for you at the very end if, if, if need be. We appreciate you coming down. Okay. Hello, Commissioners. I'm Councilwoman Angie Henderson. Uh, I serve District 34 in Southwest Nashville. Um, and I, as many of you are, I know, am uh, a fan of trees. Um, and so, uh, as Ms. Shepard spoke to, uh, many of our uh, countywide uh, planning documents, Nashville Next, Livable Nashville, uh, uh, even our walk and bike strategic plan, um, our metro uh, tree master plan, have all uh, spoken to the importance of maintaining our tree canopy. And I think uh, as we've all experienced uh, in our time of growth, we often um, as community members uh, can have a real kind of sense of loss, a real uh, palpable loss um, when uh, we do uh, lose mature trees through development. Um, we are also going to lose an estimated 10% of our tree canopy to the Emerald Ash Borer. Um, that really is out of our control. So um, we've got that uh, looming over us somewhat. And then we have just generally, as you all well know from how many items are on your agenda, uh, a, a really uh, swift pace of development. Um, the Metro Tree Advisory Committee um, has been looking at uh, the tree code uh, over several years years, uh, recking, recommending improvements, and uh, uh, many among uh, the council members care very much about this issue, um, and so uh, with uh, my co-sponsors as well, this has been something that I have been working on uh, for quite a while. Uh, truth be told, I, I wanted to bring a more uh, comprehensive bill, um, but with somewhat of that that time pressure, that really that, that sense of urgency that in this building boom, this was something uh, that we needed to go ahead and, and move ahead on. Um, uh, and uh, these um, improvements that are included in the bill uh, as proposed um, have been discussed uh, with staff, with our urban forester, with codes, uh, with uh, Metro Stormwater. Uh, uh, Rebecca Doan um, served on our Livable Nashville um, committee. Um, uh, we conversed quite a lot about uh, TDU, tree density units. Um, so there has been a lot of uh, conversation with staff, a lot of conversation uh, with the advocacy community. Um, but uh, perhaps, 
not as much uh, with our, our builder stakeholder community, but that certainly is incumbent upon um, uh, me and uh, uh, my co-sponsors to have that uh, engagement. Um, you all have received uh, one email, I think, that has expressed some concerns uh, to some of the technical uh, aspects of the code, but also, uh, by the same token, um, support uh, for the increase in TDU from uh, 14 units per acre to 20 units per acre. Um, there was also um, a suggestion related to uh, street trees and that those should count towards TDU. Um, I will tell you that Metro staff is a little bit split on that issue. Um, and in uh, speaking with planning staff, uh, I concur. Um, I've done quite a lot of work um, as it relates to street trees. Those are very important um, to a walkable community. Um, and so quite a lot of work uh, has been done on that. And so I think uh, whether street trees count to TDU or not, that is probably best addressed in a bill that is specific to street tree policy, right? So that we will look at that as its own um, bill. There was also a concern expressed um, around the disallowance of the area of building um, for sustainable design protocols, uh, you know, LEED certified buildings. Um, uh, um, uh, Ms. Hawkins, um, in her professional capacity as landscape architect, expressed concern about that, um, as did our water department. And um, uh, so that is something that um, I can commit here today to amend out in our next substitute. So I appreciate that um, suggestion and change. And then um, the other things that uh, Ms. Hawkins uh, had mentioned were uh, some of those minor technical illustration things that Ms. Shepard alluded to. Uh, so those are absolutely um, some things that we can fix, and I have spoken with Mr. Kivett about that. Um, so those are some um, technical amendments that we could bring with that next substitute. Um, so with that, I just wanted to uh, express to you all that this is an issue that I think many, many council members here um, is a concern in the community. It is something that um, many of our plans Plans, most specifically to you all, Nashville Next points to um, that we need to maintain and enhance our tree canopy. And then I wanted to speak as well um, to some of the concerns, and I think I've gone through those specifically. And so um, I also want to express on behalf of Councilman Davis and uh, Councilman Sledge that uh, public hearing uh, for this bill is currently scheduled for February 5th. So about a month from now, so that gives us quite a bit of intervening time um, to have a uh, community meeting uh, with our uh, multifamily uh, and commercial uh, builder stakeholders. And so this bill at this juncture as drafted really just is in that multifamily and commercial space. It is not getting into the single and two family home building space at this time. So um, by, I think, reaching out to key individuals uh, like Ms. Hawkins and others who work very closely uh, with that development community, um, we can get a good uh, uh, meeting um, with some good uh, feedback um, between now and um, February 5th. So um, with that, uh, I would request uh, your support. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. I appreciate it. Uh, anyone, and we'll make sure that if you would like to speak at the end, you can as well. Uh, anyone in the audience wishing to speak in support? In support? Anyone wishing, seeing none, and we'll make sure. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Kim Hawkins. I live at 2205 Natchez Trace, and it is difficult for me to be here speaking in opposition to a tree ordinance. I appreciate the interest um, at Council in the adoption of a more robust ordinance. As the owner of an 18-person landscape architecture firm and a lifelong promoter of trees and the author of the first tree ordinance under Mayor Bredesen a number of years ago, we're really on the same team. It's our profession that implements this bill for the overall community. I have four concerns, which I believe result in unintended consequences of this very well-meaning ordinance and ask for a deferral until they can be resolved. 
I thank Councilwoman Henderson for speaking with me and for her commitment to reviewing these suggestions. The first, I generally encourage improvements to the tree ordinance. However, I believe that there are issues with meeting this 43% increase in TDU in urban areas, transects four, five, and six, which typically have higher FAR and impervious surface ratios based on zoning, and suggest that applications be looked at specific uh, to this bill on a variety of those sites. I urge the strong consideration of street trees uh, through the joint effort that have been supported through joint efforts of the mayor's office and ULI, Gear Up 2020, as well as the Walk and Bike Master Plan adopted in April of 2017. Uh, and I think that those things really promote the purpose and intent. I have an overall concern with the disallowance of the building square footage um, that Angie mentioned. And lastly, prior to adoption, I urge the participation in stakeholder groups who implement and are affected by this bill and ask for their, them to be adequately engaged in providing feedback. All indicated, uh, all involved have indicated that this has not yet occurred, but they're willing for it to happen. So I respectfully ask for a deferral of this bill to provide more time for it to be fully considered by the stakeholders and by Metro planning staff. And I thank you for your time. Thank you for coming down. We appreciate it. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Nathan Oliver. Um, I reside at 1623 Woodland Street. Um, and uh, this evening I'll also be uh, speaking on behalf of uh, Middle Tennessee um, American Society of Landscape Architects. Tipton Folks was here, but um, had to leave during the break to get to another um, obligation. So I'll also be speaking um, on behalf of the uh, landscape architecture community for here in Nashville. Um, uh, first, I'd like to start by just saying that um, we commend the council uh, people for putting this bill forward um, as, um, as a person that takes great pride in being um, involved and invested in the community. I take the same pride in um, our trees and uh, the urban canopy and think it's very important that we're working to uh, improve that and um, increase the canopy uh, in, in Nashville. Personally, um, I'm the president of the Lachlan Springs Neighborhood Association. Professionally, I'm a registered landscape architect and also a member and past section chair of the um, Middle Tennessee ASLA. Um, we, um, I wanted to come before um, the board after learning of the bill last week, after taking some time to review it, um, and uh, say that generally we support the idea of the amendment and support uh, the things that are proposed in it. We do think that it would be even better enhanced with some additional time for some consideration, for some vetting, um, and to really test um, the um, improvements that are recommended within it. Um, there are a couple things, as Councilwoman uh, Henderson mentioned, that we um, would like to uh, propose uh, removing or better exploring, including the, the lead requirement. We think that would have some adverse impacts and we'd like to take some time to better understand what those may be. Um, we think that increasing the TDU number is a great opportunity. We'd also like to better understand what the opportunity is to add the street trees to um, uh, the credit for those. Um, they provide a great benefit as outlined in all the plans uh, that were mentioned uh, before me. Um, they've been identified a number of times as being um, necessary to a quality urban environment, promoting all of the strategies um, of walkability and um, alternative transportation options. Um, we think it's an opportunity to really encourage that within our development community. Uh, in a way, uh, this bill presents an opportunity uh, th that we can go ahead and address the recommendations outlined in those different plans. Um, in conversations with other professional stakeholders, um, they have uh, expressed um, support of the bill as well um, with the idea that we defer it um, so that we can have some better time to vet the proposed recommendations and improvements and better understand how those are meeting the goals of, of the tree ordinance and providing a better tree canopy for Nashville. Um, I'd like to support Councilman Withers um, and his request to defer. We've had conversations about this. Um, I've expressed the same things to him. Um, I'd like to um, support his request for deferment. Um, there's a couple comments that I would like to note uh, from Tipton folks and from uh, ASLA. Um, they, they'd like to say that they agree 
with the spirit of the ordinance and applaud sponsoring council members for bringing this matter up for, for consideration by the commission. Um, they do have some minor concerns with the language of the bill, uh, those same ones that I have expressed and believe that we can efficiently um, discuss and be considered with the input of stakeholders to make the bill more effective and avoid some negative unintended uh, consequences. In communication with them, um, once everyone learned that this was coming forward, they're excited about the opportunity within it, expressed some concern about um, wanting to have some more time to vet it and to understand it and to make sure that it is achieving all the uh, possible goals within it. Um, tonight, I'd ask that you defer the bill to allow us more time to do that and to make it um, as great as it possibly can be. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Anyone else <coughs> wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, Councilor, you want to go again, or are you comfortable? Come on up. Um, thank you for the opportunity to respond. Uh, I, you know, I, I certainly uh, do uh, appreciate uh, the concerns. I did want to correct. I, I might have misheard, but I think uh, Ms. Hawkins may have misspoken in saying that this was a 43% increase in TDU, but I believe it's just about 33 to 30 percent um so by my math but i apologize um, um and as it relates to uh the street trees being credited towards tdu um i think again there are some differing opinions um on that um and that's why i would assert that that would need to kind of happen in a separate space potentially, but I do respect that this is a good time uh, to have have that conversation in the context of this bill, and that might either inform and, or improve this bill or maybe be a little more compartmentalized to our street tree conversation um, and be addressed uh, separately. Um, again, I did express earlier, but just wanted to reiterate um, my and the co-sponsor's commitment to, uh, I think the only th thing that maybe has kind of unintended consequences was uh, the, the lead piece, the exemption for that sustainable uh, design. And so uh, co-sponsors and I are committed to amending that out. Um, and uh, so uh, with that, um, I, I guess I I would say I will appreciate hearing, um, you know, what you all uh, uh, think. And um, that said, I, I am. Uh, uh I think I have colleagues who will be uh, uh, somewhat disappointed if it is deferred, um, but what I hope um, is if that is your choice, um, that uh, staff will work with us in that intervening time uh, to take that stakeholder engagement um, and make the bill uh, even better. I know that staff is uh, not necessarily overwhelmed, I don't mean that in a negative way, but a, a lot on your plate. So um, if we do have that time, I think there are quite a few things, not just within the stakeholder community, that, but that council um, wanted to address um, specifically around uh, mature tree retention um, related to parking minimums um, and some of those things that I think are um, uh, uh, would be great to be in this bill. Um, and so uh, I'm, I guess I'm kind of neutral on, on deferral, um, but I would hope if that is your choice, that we do take that intervening time to incorporate uh, the stakeholder uh, suggestions, have that conversation, but also look at some of these uh, other things that we as council members have thought would be good improvements and also get those into the bill um, so that when we file that uh, substitute uh, from staff um, that this we're really getting to the best best bill that we can. So thank you. Thank you, Council. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, we'll declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Gobble, I'll go first. Um, well, I wholeheartedly support an update of the ordinance. I think it's going in the right direction. But I do know the unintended consequences of zoning changes. And, and uh, I sounds to me like this needs to be further vetted and thought through on how you actually implement this in, in today's world with today's projects. So those stakeholders need to be included. So I would request a deferral. Commissioner Haynes. So Council Lady Henderson is usually very thorough, and it looks like she has been with the internal city departments. Um, I think we need to be just as thorough with the development community. Uh, I think the landscape architects are surprised by this. The developers are surprised by this. Um, this is something near and dear to those local developers that we want to get right. We need to engage those stakeholders in a very thorough discussion, and I don't see the, the time sensitivity to rush through this 
and have unintended consequences impair what we're doing. So I would support uh, probably an indefinite deferral. Thank you. Mr. Fox? Um, you know, I have just sort of a random thought in this. I think it re re relates to the requirement with um, tree placement for the single family and, and two family residential lots and that it's placed in the front setback. I would just ask that whatever is going in there is not immediately going up into the NES power lines because there is nothing worse than going through all of Nashville and seeing these beautiful trees that are hacked in half. So it may well be covered in that, but I just wanted to raise that point. <laughs> Mr. Dibbs. Um, I don't have a whole lot more to add, but I do want to really commend the council um, person and your co-sponsors um, for taking this on because this is something that is uh, near to so many of us. So um, just the uh, effort to put into it to try to get it right is, is definitely commendable. And so if I don't say anything else, I want to make sure you can do that. But I do feel like kind of like what everybody said, intended consequences. Let's just, since we have an opportunity, let's just make sure we try to get it closer to right. So I, I definitely have support for it. Commissioner Blackshear, nothing? Commissioner Bichelle? Um, yeah, just a couple things. One, um, I heard, I mean, I think this is great. We, got, we need trees and we, we want to encourage trees and I'm, I'm glad you did this. Um, I just had a couple questions. One is um, for Councilwoman Henderson, you mentioned that this would primarily affect multifamily areas. And I wondered if you could explain why that is. <clears throat> so I think, uh, you know, when we look at uh, our development requirements um, and the impact uh, that those have, um, I kind of reflect on uh, our uh, update to our sidewalk requirements, let's say. And so um, the stakeholder meetings uh, that I held uh, in advance uh, of that coming to you all, um, uh, you know, we had uh, multifamily and commercial developers, um, kind of, you know, bigger projects um, as stakeholders and, um, you know, smaller scale home builders. And, uh, you know, uh, both at the table for sure, um, but, uh, uh, I think uh, when you look at, you know, the scale of, say, um, multifamily development, mixed-use development, more sizable, um, the, uh, the kind of the impl implications or impact of, you know, upping your TDU, um, requiring a landscape architect uh, seal, um, that would be new. That's not necessarily appropriate in a single and two-family space. Right, um, that is somewhat of an onerous burden on a single or two family builder to have that landscape seal say. Um, also, when we speak about TDU, right, tree density units from a you know calculation standpoint, that is also somewhat of an onerous kind of from a process standpoint on a single and two family developer, but also frankly on staff, right? Um, so, you know, things that go through your staff's. Um, uh, review, um, you know, if you start kind of adding in um, uh, uh, more things, um, that is uh, kind of complicated. So I think there are a lot of things that, you know, we have been conversing about uh, over uh, the last year or so uh, with staff, with Mr. Herbert, with Mr. Kivett, um, uh, specific to the single and two family space that are really process improvements. So um, as far as uh, the the tree replacement um, that Ms. Farr uh, was speaking to, um, you know, there has been some kind of struggle, I think, a little bit in neighborhood communities or advocate communities, you know, did those trees indeed get planted? Um, how can we make sure of that? So uh, from, uh, you know, advocates, council members, staff working together, now there is a separate UNO sign-off for tree replacement, right? So that's, that's a process improvement that can address. So we really are working on this from a staffing standpoint, from a process improvement. So I think a lot of uh, the work in the single and two-family space um, is a little bit more uh, in, uh, in process improvement, um, in uh, education uh, around uh, um, uh, tree maintenance, 
offering. We have it in there. It's a requirement. Uh, I have constituents all the time kind of calling me about, you know, oh, the tree protection's not down and the truck's parking on it and they park the building supplies. And so, you know, the tree was spared new homeowner comes in, uh, you know, a year later, that beautiful 60-foot tree is dead, right, because it was not taken care of appropriately. So that, again, is kind of proactive with staff. So, you know, whether you're an electrical inspector or whomever that goes on site saying, you know, in there, in, in the tablet, in the whatever, like, tree protection, you know, needs to be restored. Um, so I think a lot of the um, single and two-family space, there, there are, I think, some actual uh, tweaks that can be codified, um, but we just did not feel um, at, uh, at this time um, that it was, uh, we, we needed to work some more on that process improvement piece before we changed anything from a code perspective in that single and two-family space. That is a very long answer to your question. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thanks. So <clears throat> you have the first public hearing coming up February 5th. You said. Yes. I'm losing my voice during this meeting. No Sorry. Um, and so um, is there a reason, do we, I guess I should ask you this, do we have to have a decision before February 5th? Or can, can you explain that? So I think you know, as everyone has said, trees are so important to the health of our community and to its urban design quality, its public realm, it's all the ecological benefits. So we definitely want to get this right. I, I share your goal. And I think for that, um, my recommendation from a policy perspective would be to defer so that we have time to ensure that this is doing the very best that it can do substantively and that we have an opportunity to ensure that all the different stakeholders are um, engaged, especially those who are who are regulated by the standards. And so the first, I think I would first ask the, the council lady if she would be willing to defer the council, um, the the public hearing at council, and then I can give you two options for our vote okay. depending on the, the answer. Um, I, I I am willing to to make that deferral. Um, I, I would ask that you all be conscious from a process standpoint, internal to council, public hearing only happens on the first Tuesday of every month. So if I were to defer this bill, I would be deferring it to the first meeting in March. So effectively, we're gaining about two months there. That, that is a good chunk of time to work. So respectfully, um, I would ask that you not advance um, Commissioner Haynes' motion to defer indefinitely. I think two months um, offers ample time. And um, I, I do just want to express that uh, uh, you know, there's kind of what's in this bill now, and I think these are good and needed changes. Um, but there are quite a few other things that we have been working on um, with staff that we could also vet with that stakeholder community. Um, and, you know, sidewalks and trees were why I ran for office. So um, you have my commitment to do good robust stakeholder engagement, and I think uh, uh, between uh, now and our first meeting in March would be ample time to do so. Okay, so for your end now, hearing that, um, so the indefinite deferral is not as ominous as it sounds. It just gives flexibility to place it on the agenda when it's ready to go, um, but obviously we have to work within the council framework as well. So I think you'd get a similar outcome. Um, but it certainly sends a message that we're going to come together and work work the issues through. The second meeting in February is February the 28th, the second planning commission meeting. And so you could defer this to the February 28th meeting to make the March um, 5th public hearing at council. Um, that does not leave any room for additional deferral. However, I, I trust that if as we start to dig into this and we start to really work through different options that we may need to defer again um, so that we can accomplish um, a bill that meets your goals. May I ask, I'm not familiar with you, your procedure as it relates to indefinite deferral and deferral. Uh, from a council perspective, a Title 17 bill can be deferred any number of times. Mm -hmm. So there, there are no limitations on our deferral. And I think uh, you saw that with our, uh, with our sidewalk legislation. Um, we deferred that quite a few times right. um, so that we could have repeat stakeholder engagement. Um, so on our end, you know, we, we don't have a constraint. Um, when it's Title 17, we can defer it mm -hmm. as many 
coming. Do you, As can we. You, I mean, okay, I'm assuming we're going to work this until we get a, a, a set of regulations that are vetted and that meet, meet both of our me goals. Meet may, goals. may I speak to the idea of a yeah. February 28th yes. deferral? Um, I think, uh, you know, you as commissioners might look at that and say, oh, well, that's only, you know, that's barely a week of intervening time. Um, but I think uh, what we do have, though, in the intervening time from, you know, today till your February 28th meeting um, is uh, ample time to make sure that the bill that we are uh, bringing to you um, uh, is, uh, um, you know, it's 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 almost there. You know, it's it's 99 it's 99 percent. Um, so I think I, again, I keep kind of you know going back uh, to uh, to our um, sidewalk regs. Um, we uh, came to you all, I think, with uh, a, a good strong bill that you all um, uh, approved, and then subsequent to passage at Planning Commission, we did defer off public hearing several times. I think in the end we had a second substitute, maybe even a third substitute um, for that stakeholder engagement. Um, so I would be supportive of the, the February 28th approach, but I guess I would just ask Ms. Milligan and Mr. Lehman, um, what would then be though our filing deadline at council if we were wanting to, so that what would be before you? So. You know, the bill as filed is what is before you today. But if we wanted to incorporate stakeholder engagement, um, you all have the recommended substitute. So that would be the first substitute. So if I at council, could I, with this still on the agenda for February 5th, I, I guess I'm trying to think of it, Ms. Milligan, on the, on the council side of things so that I could appropriately incorporate stakeholder move the substitute so that what is before your commission is the appropriate bill. So, so what we have done in the past also with text amendments is that um, something that may be included in a substitute does not necessarily have to be formally submitted at the council for us to consider it. I appreciate that. Okay, got because, it. Because like for As tonight, today. Like right, tonight right. for yeah. instance, we are making a recommendation of a substitute which would include the inclusion of the new uh, drawings. That has not been formally recommended formally introduced at council, but we can make that recommendation and then we would send over a substitute that includes that change. Mm -hmm. And so if there were other changes that we were working through that were consistent with the goals here and of the stakeholders, then we could recommend those to be included as a substitute and then actually take the step to help work with the council office to get those introduced into a substitute. So they don't have to be formally introduced at the council for us to consider it here at this body. I appreciate that clarification, thank you. Okay, thank you, Council. Okay. We appreciate it. <clears throat> Commissioner Michelle, you got any other questions? No, I think I would lean towards making a motion to defer to February 28th at this point. Okay. Councilman? I just wanted to, sorry, you walk all the way to the chair. Okay. I wanted to double check that you are not proposing that. I'm going back to this row. I should just go here, right? <laughs> single family owners don't have to get a. Uh, Landscape plan still by a landscape architect. No, they do not with this bill. No, it is only in the multifamily and commercially zoned space that that Thanks. would be a new requirement. Councilor, is, have you estimated a cost estimate on the development community? Or is that something you've taken into consideration, maybe? I appreciate the suggestion. Um, we do, we have assigned a value to TDU. Um, and so, uh, you know, the value, I guess, of one TDU is, I believe, Ms. Hawkins, $725. So 750. So I mean, if you looked yeah. quantifiably and said you're going from 14 to 20, um, I don't know if Mr. Kibbett can speak to that. You know, that would be six more TDU, 725 times six. I mean, if you were not, I guess, uh, physically able to meet TDU on site, um, you would be contributing uh, in lieu of planting to the tree bank, right? So maybe you can achieve 18 TDU on site and you can't achieve that last two, that's 1,400 into tree bank. Well, um, I just, so, I'd say that. Just well, I, yeah, from a process standpoint, as far as incorporating the landscape architect and so forth. Yeah, and then also, you know, from a low, um, 
Well, from an affordable housing component, when you raise costs for multifamily units, you know, maybe there, to me, you know, there's all this talk, but about affordable housing, but, you know, when we keep adding, and, and I, I just say that to say, you know, maybe there could be a credit for affordable housing units or something, but. I would assert to the Planning Commission that our largest problem as it relates to affordable housing is our parking requirements. So, um, just parking Thank policy, you. we got to address that. But <laughs> I guess what I'm saying, I mean, uh, respectfully, Chairman Atkins, um, you know, a, a multifamily builder, you know, doing something at that scale is working with a firm such that I don't feel like that landscape architect seal is too onerous. I absolutely acknowledge in the in the single and two family space, um, and I, I recognize it's on a continuum. We shouldn't assume that all um, multifamily is massive and so forth. But um, I, I don't think. Uh, that that brings too much of a uh, onerous cost uh, factor Thank there, you. nor the increase in TDU. Thanks for the response. Any, is there a motion? Well, first of all, as a quick clarification, Ms. Hawkins' percentage is correct. A six unit increase on 14 trees is 43%. And I would argue, 42.8 percent. So I would argue. I apologize. I, that was not. I, I I did the math and I just I I did it on my calculator. I, uh, I do apologize, Ms. Hawkins. I, I would argue that this is not a time sensitive issue. We need to get this correctly. I don't feel compelled to get this to council on March 5th. If we're talking about a 43 percent increase in trees, we need to properly engage all stakeholders in the commercial residential community and get it correct. This is a significant increase. So I, I would propose an indefinite deferral, and as the director has said, that doesn't mean that it's going to last forever and ever, ever, but we're going to get the engagement correctly. All landscape architects in this city right now are slammed. And so to expect them to drop what they're doing, attend stakeholder meetings over the next four weeks is, is unrealistic. Well, we're, we're in that portion of the discussion to have a motion to make it to, to get a motion can i can i or say some discussion yeah yes sir you, councilman so uh, i i understand what you're saying it's an important thing to get the stakeholders uh feedback but there is a you know the council lady determines in six months mine does too so there is a realistic uh time constraint about uh being able to finish something to some point and if the Council decides to vote against it because the feedback wasn't there, then be it. But if we do an indefinite deferral that doesn't really bring this thing to some kind of a conclusion, we are not really moving the process along. So I will, I will put a deadline. I wouldn't just, with all due respect, uh, not say indefinite, but just enough time to give the stakeholders a deadline to attend to, to a meeting. And Well, I, I would push back a little bit if this were time sensitive because of term limits, then the stakeholder engagement should have happened before today. So I, that, that's not this body's issue. Good point. Um, okay. And, and quite honestly, if it's that important to get it done before term limits, then the council lady and others need to push the stakeholders and get it correctly. I, I don't wanna, Sorry, I'm engaging in a dialogue. Yeah, we, we don't want to get into a running debate. Yes. Um, but, Councilman, you recognize, so let's let's try to, yes. we, we are, anyone can, you know, any commissioner can make, make a motion. So, you know, we can try it, see where the votes are. Um, you know, it, it's up to y'all. That's, that's the procedure. Well, isn't there I, I, some uh, oh, medium oh. between? Isn't there something between a two-meeting deferral and indefinite? I mean... Four meetings? I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, we're the staff. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, we're as staff going to work the issue, and as we would anything, we may come back. If you, as as often happens, the commission will defer something to a date certain, and we're not able to get it done, and so then we come back and ask for additional time, and so that's not unusual, and we could do that in this instance. Um, I think that. 
um, it's just important that we come together quickly and try to vet this and come to a reasonable set of conditions and, and changes to the current standards. So I think, I, I honestly don't think if we did to, to the February 28th, we may be coming back and saying we want additional time. Additionally, if we indefinitely deferred, it gives us flexibility to bring it back as soon as it's ready to come. And we would be working very closely. This is not an adversarial situation. We're going to be working collaboratively with the council members to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of timing. We don't want to leave anybody. Um, yeah. can, I, can I clarify yeah. something? I wasn't trying to ask you guys to accommodate to, to our election cycle. Yeah. I was just trying to be effective in, in getting something done. Uh, right. So I apologize if... Fair if, point. Okay. Good Thanks. points. Excellent point. Counselor. Indefinite deferral or February 28th, we're still going to move as quickly as we can and get something done is what I wanted to put to, to put out there. But I will say that bringing typically with a, a complex text amendment like this, we have several stakeholder meetings. And this is one where you're dealing with water, the public works, and codes. So I am... I will say this on the record, I'm a little skeptical that we'll be able to get it done in that time frame, but I'm willing to try. Um, so to that extent, I think Commissioner Haynes is, is correct. It's it's going to be difficult to, to get, to, to vet it in that time frame. I'm willing to try if that's what the commission wants to do. And since there's not a motion, Councilor, did you have a... Not, we I don't guess, want. I guess I wanted to speak to uh, uh, Vice Chair Farr's suggestion. Like, is there um, a middle path between indefinite deferral um, and, and February 28th? Um, so I guess I, I would ask rather than indefinite deferral. Um, I think uh, Councilman uh, Bednay is right. Um, it. it uh, Respectfully, Commissioner Haynes, it 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 keeps pressure um, on uh, me and my colleagues, right, with a more finite time frame to set the meetings, get it done, engage in the work. Um, I find, from a council perspective, when you get things indefinitely deferred, you kind of lose your 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 will somewhat and your momentum, um, just because uh, we as council members we just we we've got a lot on our plate, and um, I I would like to set uh, a date certain. If that needs to be a little bit more to address your concerns, I, I do respect that. Well, Councilor, what um, so. if we how about since we've had a really spirited and, and good discussion. Um, about it, and it is obviously an important issue for all of us. Um, instead of to the last meeting in February, maybe the compromise is the last meeting in March. And then if you could defer the, the council meeting, and that would hearing? give us three months instead okay. of two months. Well, Jeff, would that? Uh, well, what I'd love to do is get Ms. Hawkins' feedback. I mean, as a, the landscape architect who wrote the first um, tree ordinance, uh, how long is it going to take her to get all the landscape architects in the city, all the developers in the city, to sit down with Council Lady Anderson and get the feedback? I, is that enough time, Kim? Is three months enough time? Uh, I would suggest that right now you're asking me to speak on behalf of a very large group of people that I can't appropriately. Here, come on up to the microphone. That way we can get just get it on the record. We want to make sure that all of the discussion is transparently on record. And, and the association, potentially. Um, I, I mean, I really appreciate you asking, and um, I just can't represent the whole community. I can say that this is fairly new to us. We've been looking at it for one week now, and it will take more time, uh, that most in the development community are not aware of it at all. Um, so I would so, love so to since say you can't answer that, how long did it take you to write the first tree ordinance? <laughs> Quite some time. So, we need to get this right. And so, I, I would move for an indefinite deferral and encourage the staff to work diligently with the stakeholders and engage them. Would the goal to be to have this done prior to August election? That's a proper motion. There's a second for an indefinite in deferral. Well, we're. I just want to say that on the, the people that I can speak on behalf of are myself and persons in my office who are committed to this. We are committed to working. We, we do have plenty, plenty going on. Um, but we're committed to working with planning staff, with Stefan, 
with Angie has been great about from the very beginning, first time I talked to her a couple of days ago, is saying, I absolutely want to work with you. We're committed to that. I think that we have, there's a lot more than just us. That's, that is the truth. There's a lot more than just us. Um, most of the architectural community is not aware of this at all. It has ramifications on a lot of people. And so it is important that we get it right. Okay. Thank you. All right, Can I so, just ask one thing too? Um, do we have a motion? Yes. Yeah, so, so here we are. We prop, proper motion, properly seconded. We're still on discussion. So, you, um, Vice Chair, you recognize? I I have very little knowledge about tree ordinances, <laughs> um, and I do see in some of these reports. I mean, I will go and, and and do some of my own research. But I think in the in the presentation next time, or somehow, if we could kind of get some context on what other cities do and how this is handled in other cities, because I have no idea if where we're going is higher than what other comparable, you know, I don't know. I have no way of evaluating that. Suggestion. That's a great suggestion. And, uh, uh, I only just want to say, just right. want to say um, I do agree we need to give as much time as, you know, as much time as necessary, <laughs> but I don't, I mean, she didn't bring it up. We would be in a worse situation. We, well, I won't say worse, but we wouldn't necessarily be where we are right now. <clears throat> so I don't want to lose that momentum that we've got. So if it, you know, I don't. That's what I just don't want it to happen. It just keeps getting kicked off until we lose it altogether. So, like I guess I commend her for doing it. And I appreciate it. you're right. We need to make sure we get enough time to get it right. But if it's four meetings, <laughs> I don't know. Just let's. She's. She knows how that group works, and if they need a deadline, I think, we, you know, I need a deadline. If you tell me forever, I'll work, procrastinate forever, you know? <laughs> That's what designers do, so I say we give her a deadline. If we need to get it another month, four months, I mean, that's whatever, you know, so that's just my well, two so we, we, we're still on the discussion for the motion of, of an indefinite deferral, so is there any? That's an appropriate comment, Commissioner. Any other discussion on that? Wait, I thought the motion was uh, before the August election. It was not indefinite. No, it, the, the motion uh, was an indefinite deferral. An indefinite deferral was the motion. He was arguing his point about the election piece. Is there, is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the indefinite deferral say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, eyes, raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Noes. One, two, three, four. That means it's a tie. Motion did not pass. Motion fails. Is there another motion? I will make a motion for a four meeting deferral. Four meeting or a month? Four no. So four meeting. No. Hold on. Four meeting That's deferral. That's the end of March, right? That's what we said. Isn't that four meetings? So you're proposing the second meeting in March. In March. March. The March second planning commission meeting. Yes. Okay. Can you, the March the 28th? Okay. March 28th. Uh, hold on one second, Councilman. So it's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. Councilman. I'm going to vote for this. Uh, and I also, I'm doing it knowing that if we see that day that we need more time, we can defer again. But at this point, I think it's important to set up some kind of a deadline, a goal, so to speak, uh, to, to see if we can make it work. But I am very mindful of uh, being that I'm on that profession that it can be hard. Uh, but the balance is in between uh, getting overwhelmed by the circumstances and not fixing a problem and uh, just setting up a deadline. So I think it's worthwhile to set up a deadline, see if we can make, meet it. If we don't meet it, then we can defer again. Any other discussion? We, so we have a proper, so our, um, we have had a, a motion. Oh, one, right. yes. Should we put on the record some milestone that we want to achieve before we actually um, meet so that our milestone is that we have that at least two meetings of landscape are some kind of milestone or do we want to leave that out? I think that our director um, can kind of come up with a, 
internal and, and with the, the council lady, kind of an internal, and I, I trust our, our team and the council enough to, to do that and, and make sure it gets done. Right? Is that true? Yes. Madam thank Director? you. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So she's going to, she's going to, I, I think that's clear. And the staff's real good about taking our intent from these meetings and then coming up with an action plan. So very clear um, that this is. And I also just want to put on record that I would also like to know what the impact is on small multi-family groups, like two, two or three family or four family. Um, or whatever uh, not units just it applies big to. big ones yeah. versus a single family. Okay, that's fair. Um, so, procedurally, we had a motion. Second, we're in discussion for a the second meeting in March, which is March 28th. Is that correct? That's okay. Any other discussion on that motion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no? No. Ayes have it. There's only one, one no, I think. It's Commissioner Correct. Haynes. All right. All right. Item 32. We're making just a little transition here with our staff attorney. We, real quick, and then make sure we don't lose quorum. We work so good. All right, here we go. Item 32. The next item on this evening's agenda is item 32. This is a request to rezone from RS5 to R6. Staff's recommendation is to disapprove. Property is located at 327 Gatewood Street, approximately 436 feet west of Lishy Avenue, and contains approximately 0 0.18 acres. The neighborhood consists of a mixture of one and two family residential uses within an established street network. The property is currently vacant. RS5 is intended for single family dwellings and requires a minimum lot size of 5,000 square feet. Lishy Avenue is located just to the east of the site, and the surrounding zoning is RS5, as you can see on the screen. The policy for the site is T4 Urban Neighborhood Maintenance, and is located within the Highland Heights Study Supplemental Policy Area. T4 Urban Neighborhood Maintenance is intended to preserve the general character of existing urban residential neighborhoods. These areas will experience some change over time when buildings are expanded or replaced, and when this occurs, efforts should be made to retain the existing character of the neighborhood. The Highland Heights Supplemental Policy was adopted after an extensive community engagement process in June of 2018. The Supplemental Policy established a building regulating plan and a mobility plan. The building regulating plan identifies nine distinct sub-districts and provides guidance tailored to the unique circumstances and community vision for each sub-district. The mobility plan establishes a neighborhood scale, street hierarchy, typology, and cross-section, identifies new public street connections, and identifies new public alley infrastructure. The community character policy for this site did not change with the adoption of the Highland Heights supplemental policy. This site, which is highlighted in red on your screen, is located within the R1 subdistrict of the building regulating plan. This district is intended to maintain existing low to moderate density, predominantly single family residential patterns. The R1 subdistrict only permits single family structures and detached accessory dwelling units. 
The requested rezoning to R6 would allow for a two-family housing type, which is inconsistent with the character and housing form as identified within the R1 subdistrict of that Highland Heights supplemental policy. While R6 would allow for the construction of a detached accessory dwelling unit, a duplex would also be allowed within the R6 zoning district, which is inconsistent with the adopted Highland Heights supplemental policy. And in conclusion, staff's recommendation is to disapprove. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. We'll open this item for public hearing. And is the applicant in the room? Come on up. You know the drill, I believe, by now. It's I 10 do. minutes for the applicant, and then you can save two minutes of the 10 for rebuttal. Thank you. For it's not going to take 10 minutes. I appreciate everyone hearing me, and uh, I appreciate planning, working with us. Um, I really didn't want to speak to the Highland Heights plan. Um, I'll, I'll contextualize it a little bit, speaking to the plan. In the charrettes, we left the charrettes believing there was going to be some density allowance in the middle of Highland Heights. I could bring emails and some other stuff showing where when we left the charrette, the colors were supported duplex lots, HPRs. And then somewhere in the steering committee meetings after the public hearings were closed, that was not the case. We'd been talking about doing something with a couple, a couple of neighbors had approached us because we have this empty lot. They were talking about doing something more dense. I actually said in the middle of a neighborhood, something more dense wouldn't. They were talking like retail at the bottom and going up a few stories. I was like, this is the middle of a neighborhood. It wouldn't be appropriate. Um, that's just to contextualize. Um, then when we got into the charrette, everyone was asked not to support or not to submit any zoning changes. So in good faith, we didn't submit this zoning change. I, I could have. Some people did submit some zoning changes during that time. We were asked not to, so we didn't. Then much to our surprise, we were not, the R8 was not supported, or R8 was supported actually. There was a question back to planning about the R8 and we never heard anything else. It was listed as R8, most of the lots are R6 lots, so if they're only, if they're less than 8,000 square feet, you guys are well aware that an, R, an R8 zoning really means nothing. You're not gonna be able to build it because you don't have the square footage. Um, so now we're bringing this uh, request back up. Before I talk to the council member about this request uh, a second time, I went to the neighborhood meeting um, because I did take what I heard at the charrette seriously. Um, they were, and I think we heard that on item number nine, they want to maintain the character of the neighborhood. We have committed to um, ensuring, putting uh, mechanism, mechanisms in place to ensure that a single fi family style house is built even though it's going to be two dwellings. Uh, I have some examples here. I've shown them, I showed some examples that day. Uh, I would say at the neighborhood meeting, we generally had support. I think if you touch base with Stacy Harmon, he would say we generally had support. Uh, they were appreciative of the fact that we came uh, to them first and tried to include them in the process. Um, just so you know, I plan on putting a deed restriction in the, in the uh, deed, Houston, Texas, at least from an article I read a year ago, I don't know if it's still the case, has no zoning laws. They do it all through deed restrictions. So if neighbors get together, all the neighbors have to be engaged, not just the guys in the development community that are for the massive density and the people that don't want any density. I mean, everybody, the people who are sitting at home watching TV and don't ever watch Channel 3. Uh, they, they get involved because you gotta make sure everybody's willing to go along with your deed restrictions so that no one can come in and build the 10 story high. Uh, so I'm willing to do a deed restriction. Uh, I talked with Scott right before we left. Uh, Patrick had called me <clears throat> to discuss possibly doing a what they call regulatory SP. I'm not super familiar with it. Scott said maybe we can convert to that. Um, we're going to look at that. I'm committed to this looking like something that should be in the neighborhood. Uh, I've done this before with other folks. I'm not going to actually develop it though. I want to be completely transparent. And I was completely transparent with the Highland Heights neighborhood. Uh, I'm going to focus on my one hard thing. Um, so I think we heard that they don't care about increased density as much as they do the character of the neighborhood. Uh, I can pass these pictures around to show you what the person who's planning on developing it, if you guys are interested in yeah, seeing it. Yeah, if you just hand. I've the, got a couple of them. Pass them through. Um, and I took that concern seriously when I heard it at the charrette. So we, uh, we're putting a deed restriction. It's contractually, they're obligated to do this. Uh, I'm going to look at 
work with Scott. Patrick had called me and said, um, is there any way you'd consider regulatory SP, but all we were gonna be able to do was a DADU, and that obviously wasn't what we'd ever intended to do when we acquired the property, so that, that didn't work for us. Um, I think the plan maintains the integrity and consistency and congruity which Ashante spoke to of the neighborhood. I think you saw many Highland Heights neighbors here speak against the other development. I know we will have some opposition to this, but I think it'll be limited opposition. Uh, and if there was not some agreement that we are trying to reach across the aisle, I think, uh, I think you'd have more neighbors against it. But uh, I've, I've listened to what the neighbors said. I've tried to work in that context, and I appreciate you uh, taking the time to listen to me. Thank you, sir. We'll reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Anyone here wishing to speak in support? Come on up. And you have two minutes. State your name and address for the record. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nathan Agno. I live at 3913 Stilton. Um, long and short, I am supportive of uh, trying to get it rezoned. I believe there's a, currently the, it's an empty lot and there is a uh, just brush and trees that are kind of unsightly. And from what I've seen, there's other developments on staying back at 1414 that are similar to what he's proposing, one at 1430, one at 1514 Meridian, and one at 1708 Lishy. So just here to show my support. Thank you, sir. Appreciate right. you coming Thank down. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Welcome. Good to see you. Hello again. Hello. Chairman Atkins and members. Um, my name is Martha Carroll. I live in the house that's just west of that property at 325 Gatewood. Um, I appreciate that Mr. Kendig has made the effort to come to our neighborhood meeting and uh, has also talked with me personally. Uh, and I think he really is committed to making this fit the character of the neighborhood. But two observations. One is um, I was at that neighborhood meeting that he attended and um, perhaps it felt like support, but we really don't take positions as a neighborhood association. Uh, that's a part of how we operate. And so uh, we're always happy when a developer comes and we listen and ideas might be shared, um, but only individuals can can take a position one way or the other. And so as a, as a former chairman of the Neighborhood Association and continuing to be an active member, uh, I don't think that he can speak about whether support is limited or not. Uh, I don't think he has that information, frankly. Um, this was zoned for single family dwellings. And it's true that at the other end of Gatewood, which uh, m meets Meridian, uh, there are several tall, skinny buildings and, and, and you know, uh, units that include two houses. And that's not how this is zoned here. He's asking for an exception. And the um, street is very narrow. Gatewood is a very narrow street. And um, I just, if we're gonna make changes, then I see some issues coming up later on as we piece by piece make some changes. I do think he has good intentions, but that property's gonna be sold. And so I don't see how he can guarantee really what's gonna happen there. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Come on up. Hello again, I live at 1602 Lishy Avenue, which is right around the corner um, using that alley access. And um, this lot is um, one of the, f one, the only one that's really available in that whole neighborhood. And I, rather than talk specifically about this lot, it, in terms of character, Stainback is the one to really look at because without a whole lot of regulation, it has become, um, uh, an example of how runaway uh, development can happen in terms of density in single family lots. And that particular that particular lot and up and up until almost to Meridian is still really decent single family homes as 
all the surrounding ones are. And this slide is particularly important because it would set a standard, as the way that the hill goes down, it would set a standard of having something too high that doesn't match anything. It will block the view of at least three houses that surround it. And um, it wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to have access off the alley while they're thinking, oh great, we can put more density because we have an alley. That alley is not, you can't circumvent it into a driveway because it's too narrow. And then the, the street on, um, um, Gatewood has no sidewalks, it's um, storm drains, and there's not room to really, there's, I don't know if there's a plan to do anything with Gatewood anyway, but even for the uh, sidewalks, it, there's no room for that sort of thing. So a single family home with a driveway in from uh, the Gatewood access would be the best use of that property. And as a person that plans on going out of my house feet first, it would be really nice to know that I'm not, um, that sight lines uh, for people's houses that have lived there for a very long time were not interrupted by something that didn't fit with the character of the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, rebuttal, two minutes. So a couple of points. Um, first, I'll pull it in. I spoke with some of the neighbors, they were in support. I went out and talked to the president of the Neighborhood Association before I said, now, can I say you generally support it? He said yes. So he can come back up here and say no. So I'll withdraw that comment. He said yes. He thought there was general support for it, the president, Stacy. Uh, second, Houston does not have any planning or zoning. I know that <laughs> seemed weird to me when I first read it. They do everything with deed restrictions. I'm planning on putting a deed restriction in the deed. It's already in the contract. I have another example where I did this one other time and the uh, individual started to sell the property and I called her up and I said, if you sell the property, make sure you have, you're willing to, you know, make sure the next person does what we said they were going to do because that's what I told the neighborhood association. I have a couple more pictures of, and this is what was developed. She, they ended up, ended up developing it. It's 1126 Shelton for any of the clients that may be familiar with that. You can see the houses they built and, uh, she ended up not selling it because I told her I would take legal action and I was only contractually committed to her. I'm putting a deed restriction on the property so that at the Register of Deeds office it will say this is all you can do with the property. When someone does a title search, they will have issues getting title insurance if they don't do with the property what they're supposed to do with the property. How many investors or homeowners would buy a property that you could not get title insurance on? Uh, I keep hearing with the character of the neighborhood. I think both these are great designs. Uh, these are not my designs. These are the individuals that are thinking of, of the, I brought several, but I think especially the one on top, you know, it's, it fits perfectly with the neighborhood. So in that I'll end it and hopefully we can, we can all get home. Uh, and again, I tried to work with, you know, Patrick reached out to me. We tried to do something. We couldn't get there. I was more than willing to work with planning. I was hoping I could get their, their approval, but sometimes you just can't get there. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Tibbs, you want to go first? Um, so the, um, the the concept of the SP, I didn't understand why. Was it just a regulatory? Was the only one that was offered up? Or, um, I kind of lost a little bit on the SP conversation. Sure. Um, so in this subdistrict of the Highland Heights study, which is the R1 subdistrict, it um, allows uh, a, it, the building regulating plan kind of tells you what kind of uses are appropriate, what kind of form is appropriate. In this case, for R1, it permits house, one unit, and detached accessory dwelling units. And so when we got the request, we reached out to the applicant and said, we can't support this because it's not supported by the regulating plan. But if you wanted to come in with a regulatory SP that would permit a single family house and an accessory detached accessory dwelling unit, then that's something that we could support that would be consistent um, with the policy. Um, but it would not support two units. And so it was a, an attempt to get at a rezoning that would be consistent with the Highland Heights study. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, that was my only question. Thanks. Commissioner Bichelle. Um, <clears throat> I, I started out on this commission um, with a bunch of meetings that were always about Highland Heights. 
And I was so excited when we had that charrette and the plan and there was so much community involvement. I totally understand that it's disappointing if you sort of got caught in the crossfire there, but um, I think the reason we did that whole charrette and that whole plan was to avoid this piecemeal one property at a time thing. And so I think that, you know, that process was a good one and it came up with this plan and, and we should adhere to it. Councilman? Question go. No comments. Last year. Can we just see a zoning map for the general area? <coughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't see any reason. I support staff's recommendation, and what Commissioner Bichelle said, I think, was very good, it's very on point. For sure, I'll make a motion that we support staff's recommendation to disapprove. Second. That's a proper motion. And second, any other discussion? Seeing none. All in favor of staff report dis disapprove. Say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and it's disapproved. We're on item 33. <coughs> The next item on the agenda is item 33. Hold, hold on one second. So let me, let me, this was pulled, so I wanna make sure that we have this right. This was pulled um, off of the consent agenda. So are there folks here that are in opposition? Or, and are, so is, is there any, so is everyone here in support of this proposal? Okay. Well, so instead of holding a, a public hearing, since nobody's here to oppose it, um, we could put it on back on the consent agenda and pass it. Would that be okay? <laughs> Raise your hand if that's okay. <laughs> All right, so I feel very positive about that. So let's try this. If it, Is there a motion to put this item, uh, item 33 back on the consent? <laughs> There's been a proper motion. That's a proper motion and second. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. And item 33 is back on the consent agenda and has passed. So um, thank you very much. That concludes. And I'm so sorry y'all are still here. <laughs> now, but it's kind of getting a, a feel for uh, what we do on the commission. <laughs> Yeah, what you wanted to know. You've learned a lot about planning tonight, so <laughs> thank, thank you for coming down. Uh, so that leads us to anything on historic, item 41. Anything on historic? No, I've, I've lost the one that was, that we mm -hmm. consent, which case that was. Um, Text amendment item number 25. 25. Yep. Yes, appreciative of that. And, um, that's kind of the main thing I just wanted to bring up about uh, 25. And the other one, too, about the, the, the actual units. The, um, the uh, uh, well, I should have my stuff together. But anyway, that was it. We'll, we'll just stop with that. Thank you, today. Commissioner Tibbs. Oh, no. That's it. 25 was it. That's it. 25 is it. OK, perfect. Uh, item 42, Parks. No Anything? report. Mr. Commissioner Haynes. Executive Committee, uh, Vice Chair, we don't have anything except we do, I'm sure the director is going to say this, but we have a very exciting workshop planned uh, where we're going to go around um, kind of like what the, the mayor did at the Planning Commission and all the commissioners. I really encourage the commissioners to come to this because um, you'll get to interact with the, the staff team and the, their divisions and see exactly what they do. And they're going to run us through some kind of scenarios right mm -hmm. so it, it's a lot of fun um and I, I learned a lot and so i really encourage uh, the vice chair and i really encourage everybody to to <laughs> attend 
Is and this that, like a scout? The date on that is February the first week in February of February fifth yeah. and at lunch and we will feed you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Item seventeen. That was what I was. Oh, item seventeen on the history. Okay. Uh, and then, how about we do this? We'll do, is there a legislative update? And then we'll get back to, we'll let the director finish us off here. I don't, but I'd like to address the commission. I would, please, you recognize. And I don't know how to do this, but I was, uh, in the council we had an issue uh, last year with the community wanting to speak to the council. And Vice Mayor Briley at the time uh, agreed to change the rules to allow the public to address the council on issues that are not legislative in, in nature. So now they have an opportunity to place a request through a website or to call the office and ask uh, to have an opportunity to address the council. Uh, I see many people that uh, may want to talk to the commissioners and then they come to talk to the commission through a rezoning maybe. So I was just wondering, something for you to consider. We already have plenty of meetings, so you probably don't necessarily think this is necessary, but I thought it might be uh, a transparency effort if we dedicated every so often an opportunity for the residents of Davidson County to come and address the commissioners, either during a uh, planning commission meeting or a specially a, a set up meeting. Just an idea uh, that I wanted to share with you all. Thank you, Councilman. Why, why don't we, you and me and the director, get together and our uh, the vice chair, and we'll let's talk about it. I, that's interesting, and uh, I think that this commission is is very um, committed to transparency. So let's keep that conversation going, and and let's talk. Thanks. Good idea. Um, anything else, Councilman? You're good on legislation. Everything is awesome in the council. All right. Director, you recognize. Thank you. Um, we're really excited to see y'all February the 5th. We'll do a tour. We'll make it fun and interactive. Um, and I know that last uh, meeting I mentioned that we had a new uh, attorney who was working with the commission, Juan Poole. Did I pronounce that correctly? Uh, Quan. Oh, Quan Poole, pardon me. Um, Quan Poole, and now he is here in the flesh stepping in, and so I hope if uh, you didn't have a chance to meet him and during the break that you welcome him to our fun, happy family here. Welcome, Quan. We appreciate your, your service to this commission. We try to be fun. We do. <laughs> But he has experience with BZA and the Historic Zoning Commission, so he's accustomed to working on difficult land use issues with commissions, and we're the funnest by far of all of those. So I think it'll be it'll be great. But we welcome you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Adjourn. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.